today on DOOMED! This past Sunday, the people of Peru went to the election booth and they voted for one of two choices. Either the left-wing candidate, a teacher and unionist, or the far right-wing candidate who is the daughter of a former Peruvian president who's currently in jail for crimes consisting of corruption and human rights abuses. Sounds like an easy choice, right? Well, for a lot of people it seems like it wasn't because the results are so close, we still don't have a winner. Uh, it sounds a little bit uh, familiar, right? Uh, but joining me now to discuss all of that, let's pull us up on the feed here. Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Jo Marie Burt. She's an associate professor of political science and Latin American studies at George Mason University and a senior fellow at the Washington Office on Latin America and, of course, an expert on Peru. Uh, Dr. Jo Marie Burt, thank you so much for joining me today. Sure, it's my pleasure to be here. Now, I, I guess you know, there's, there's actually a lot I would like to discuss with you. Um, and I guess we should start with what uh, is probably on everyone's mind, and that's the election. And it, it seems like we, we still don't really know for sure who the winner is. But before we jump into that, let's can you give us a brief rundown of how we got here? Now, actually, a couple of months ago, I had a, um, a Peruvian student uh, who lives over in Peru on the show to discuss the protests that happened and, and tell us, you know, how they basically went through three presidents in like a matter of a couple of, a a couple of weeks. One week. Right. One week. Wow. One. I misremembered that. Yeah, I got it mixed up. Three presidents, one week, not the other way around. Uh, can, can you just break down how we got here and who the two candidates uh, were or are, I should say? Sure. Well, let me, there's, there's a very long history uh, to, to understanding what's happening uh, in Peru right now. But let's start with the first round elections, which took place in April of this year. There were 18 candidates and none of them got more than 15 percent in that first round vote. So the top vote getter was the guy you just mentioned, the teacher, the unionist, the leftist, Pedro Castillo. He got the most votes, votes 15%. It was not really a lot, but he got the highest vote. The second highest vote getter was Keiko Fujimori, the far right candidate that you mentioned, and she got almost 11% of the vote. So in that first round, only the two top, top candidates only got around 25% of the vote. So they're not exactly super popular candidates, right? And the, right. the field was very divided, right? And so as a result, th there were also simultaneous elections for Congress. So you have now 10 parties represented in the new Peruvian Congress that will be inaugurated starting on July 28th. Okay, so the second round, the way Peru's elections work is if no one wins a majority in the first round vote, it goes to a second round, the top two vote getters run off in a second vote. So now you have this far left, this far right, neither of whom are terribly popular um, go, going up against each other. So that's how we got to where we are today in, in the immediate short term. There's obviously a much longer history here that maybe we can get into. Um, and as the campaign evolved, these two candidates started to appeal to uh, voters in some 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 voters, I think, voted in favor of the candidates for what they stood for, which we can talk about. But a lot of people were voting for one or the other candidate because they didn't like the opposite candidate. Right. So there's a lot of people in Peru who don't like Keiko Fujimori and everything that she stands for. In fact, this is her third presidential run which apparently is the third time she's failed, which we will talk about. We, we don't know. There's no official winner yet, but I'm pretty sure she lost. We'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> um, so, um, and then people voted against who didn't like Pedro Castillo, who represents his far left uh, position and proves the country with um, a strong aversion to leftism in, among some sectors of the population because 
not only because of the history of the Shining Path, a Maoist, very violent insurgency that was active in the 80s and 90s, but also because of a sort of leftist, reformist military government in the 1960s that expropriated big, um, uh, they call them latifundios, big sort of landed estates from the very wealthy oligarchy and either gave them to peasants or created state-run co-ops with them. So there's a long history of anti-leftism among middle and upper class Peruvians. Right. So it wasn't just anti-shining path, anti-left. It's this longer history of anti-anything that smacks of, you know, center left. Right, right. It it seems like when you look at, uh, you know, that area, like all of Peru's neighbors have, you know, a, a strong leftist, you know, even if they're not currently the ruling party, they have some sort of strong leftist party in that country, whereas Peru always has seen uh, always has seemed to be more uh conservative or or further to the right than than their neighboring uh countries i would say that that's true um over the last 30 years but in the 1980 when i first went to peru in 1986 peru had a very vibrant legal democratic left that participated in elections in fact the mayor of lima at the time was a marxist he was the head of a of a coalition called the united left But what happened? The Shining Path was growing at exactly the same time. Uh, Their plan was to take power through a violent armed revolution, and anyone who stood in their way was an enemy. So the left, was this legal left that I'm talking about, the united left, was suddenly being attacked by the Shining Path on the extreme left, and by the military on the right, which didn't distinguish between the United Left and the Shining Path. So the United Left kind of got crushed in the context of the conflict that took place between the government and the Shining Path in the 1980s and into the 1990s. So by the time the 1990s came around, that United Left party, one of the biggest left-wing coalitions in Latin America in the 80s, vanished. Right. Vanished. So that... What, sorry, that's why what you see from the from the '90s forward is really very conservative um, uh, politics in Peru. Right now, and if I'm not if I'm not, I'm not wrong, um, that government that cracked down and squashed the left is uh, Fujimori's father, Alberto Fujimori. Correct. So right. So I mean, it it, it, it this anteceded Fujimori, but but but. Keiko's father, Alberto Fujimori, came to power in 1990 in the midst of this um, uh, armed conflict between the Shining Path and the military, when the economy of Peru was, I mean, really in the toilet. The economy crashed. Um, hyper. I mean, I remember hyperinflation was like 7,000% in 1989. Imagine what that must have been like. Um, the currency literally lost all of its value. The government had to create an entirely new currency, right? Um, The violence was expanding and the political parties, sort of the traditional political parties were all kind of imploding. People had lost confidence in the system. And this outsider came along and said, I'm going to change everything. I'm not going to carry out a neoliberal austerity shock plan the way my rival, now the Nobel laureate Mario Vargas Llosa, is promising to do and he, out of nowhere, sort of not unlike what happened with Pedro Castillo this time around, he kind of appeared out of nowhere just a few weeks before the election, the first round of elections. He started appearing in the polls, started inching his way up, and boom, he made it into the second round of election. And he ultimately defeated Vargas Llosa in 1990, became president. And in 1992, about, an, about a year and a half into his um, government, he carried out what is known in Peru as the autogolpe, the self-coup. He basically shut down the Congress, he took over the judiciary, and he suspended the Constitution, all with the backing of the military. And he basically then had total power, and he he used that power to radically change Peruvian society, impose neoliberal economics. He um, basically wiped out the opposition. There was a lot of repression, a lot of um, human rights abuses at this time. Um, And he ruled for the rest of the decade in a very authoritarian manner. 
And so, yeah, that's Keiko Fujimori's father. And that is who she models herself on. There have been moments, both in the 2016 campaign and in this campaign, where she she tried to say, I'm sorry for what happened in the past, but no one really believed it. Right. I mean, because she said many, many times, A, that she's going to implement a hard, a heavy-handed uh, approach to crime, to violence, to whatever social problems exist, the same way her dad did. She's promised to uh, release her dad from prison. You mentioned Fujimori was sent to jail. He was prosecuted and sent to jail in 2009 for human rights violations, as well as a series of corruption uh, cases. She promises to free him. And yeah, he, didn't go, he, know, didn't go, he didn't go straight to jail either. Like he fled, you know, right? He fled. So his government collapsed in the midst of a series of corruption scandals. Uh, videos were released uh, into the public that showed his number one security advisor, uh, Vladimiro Montesinos, uh, basically paying off opposition congressmen to abandon their political party and join their political party so that they could have a majority in Congress and rule the way they wanted to. Uh, and then a whole series of videos started leaking out, like literally hundreds. I, I have six, is it six or eight volumes of transcripts of these videos. They're called the Vladi videos. And they show him bribing uh, members of the opposition, politicians, military officials, media moguls, economic elites, you name it, they're in there. So these tapes were released Montesinos fled the country, and then shortly after, uh, thereafter, Fujimori fled the country, um, along with a bunch of suitcases, presumably containing videos that we probably will never see, and probably some money as well. We, we, we just don't know. Uh, and the Peruvian government and the victims of his regime tried to get him extradited from Japan unsuccessfully, um, but ultimately... He decided to leave Japan, where he had been given citizenship by the Japanese government. So he was being protected by the Japanese government, despite all the charges against him. Um, and he went, to Ch he went to Chile. This was in 2005. And there were elections coming up in 2006. Now, even though he was a heavy-handed dictator under whom there were massive human rights violations, he was popular among a certain segment of the Peruvian population because he was seen as someone who controlled inflation, got the economy back on track under his government, the Shining Path, leaders were, were arrested and violence decreased. So he was seen by at least some people as, you know, someone who set things right in Peru. So his advisor said, come to Chile, from there, you can launch your 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 re-election campaign. You'll be good to go. Only they didn't realize this is the age of human rights, right? right. When you know, when uh, Augusto Pinochet, the dictator of Chile in 1998, went to London for back surgery, what happened to him? He was arrested, and the, the Spanish government tried to have him extradited uh, to Spain to stand trial for. Uh, torture and other human rights abuses committed during his dictatorship. So I'm not going to say that any every dictator who leaves their home is going to be subjected to this kind of uh, treatment, but it, it happens, and it's happened to many others as well. And that's what happened to Fujimori. Right. He landed in Chile, and he was almost virtually immediately arrested. Um, and within a matter of uh, two years, he was extradited back to Peru, put on trial, I was in the courtroom. I was an international observer for that trial and uh, was pretty much obsessed with what was happening in that courtroom um, because it's not every day that you see a former head of state. And I, I had just written a book about his government. Um, so I knew a lot about what they were talking about. Uh, so it's just not every day you see a former head of state put on trial for uh, massive human rights abuses. And it was an extraordinary proceeding. He was found guilty, sentenced to the maximum of 25 years, um, and he's still in jail today. He was released in 2017 by the president at the time, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, a banker who defeated Keiko in 2016. And the reason he uh, uh, pardoned Fujimori was basically to save his own skin. 
Keiko refused to accept her defeat in 2016, and she was doing everything in her power to obstruct the Kuczynski government and force him out of office. And so what Kuczynski did was strike a deal with Keiko Fujimori's brother, get this, who was a member of Congress at the time, and and his his uh, Keiko's brother, his name is Kenji, he struck a deal with the president, said, I will make sure that part of my party does not vote to remove you if you free my dad. Jeez. So he's like going against what his sister wants because his sister is trying to remove the president because what he really wants is his dad out of jail. Right. So the president agrees thinking he's going to save his own skin. And he did it on Christmas Eve. It ruined my Christmas that year. Ruined a lot of people's Christmas that year. In fact, on that Christmas Eve, tens of thousands of Peruvians went into the street instead of going to their family homes for Christmas dinner to protest this illegal pardon. Right. Um, ultimately, what happened is um, the, inter the International American Court of Human Rights ruled that this uh, pardon was illegal and then sent it back to the Peruvian courts and then the Peruvian courts essentially nullified the pardon. And guess what? They sent Fujimori back to jail, which is where he is today. And how, how would his daughter get him out this this time? If that's what she wants. Well, right? you know, this is what this is what she does. She she um, she says one thing, but she means another. She says, I, I will free him. It's my political will. It's my political decision. But I will do so respecting the process. But that's an oxymoron because the, the process has already happened. There's already been, you know, Peruvian tribunals and international tribunals that say there is no possibility of a pardon in this case. And that's for two reasons. One, he was convicted of gross violations of human rights. In international law, you cannot pardon such such abuses. And the other reason is he was convicted in um, of uh, aggravated kidnapping, right? And he himself, is he's the one who passed that law essentially to punish members of the Shining Funny Path and another... Uh, another uh, guerrilla group that, that did a lot of kidnapping. But he was convicted of aggravated kidnapping and Peruvian law says you cannot pardon those convicted of aggravated kidnapping. Now the presidents do have the right to pardon, but it's not an absolute right in Peru. So it's conditioned by these two things. The only way he could be pardoned is if he is granted a humanitarian pardon, which requires that he either is essentially on his deathbed or has some kind of degenerative disease that's going to lead to. So if he had like a really bad kind of cancer, I think everyone in Peru, including the victims, would agree that the humanitarian thing would be uh, to allow him to live out his final days at home. Right. But just because Keiko Fujimori feels like he should be free, that's not a reason. Right. Right. So that's that's the problem there. Right. I feel like I feel like people in in this country see uh, you know all these. Uh, leaders in you know South American countries, Latin American countries, you know actually face the music and they think to themselves, oh man, what's what's going on down there? There's so much, many corrupt leaders, but it's like no, that's not the issue. The issue is that they they actually seem to punish them for doing what they did, whereas all the world yeah. leaders everywhere else seem to get away in, with. In some cases, <laughs> that is true. There have been significant prosecutions in Latin America for both corruption and for human rights abuses in many countries of the region. In some countries, there's been really nothing. Brazil, for example. Right. No no military official was ever convicted for human rights abuses that occurred during that, that dictatorship. Um, there were some uh, corruption trials in Brazil. But so, so, so it's a mixed bag, but, but there have been important cases where presidents... Uh, and other high-ranking government officials have been held to account. And I think that is important. In fact, you know, um, I remember, uh, you know, I, I know probably your your listeners are thinking about the most recent administration, but I'll just take us back uh, a few before that. In 2014, I remember sitting uh, at my kitchen table, drinking my morning coffee, listening to NPR, and uh, hearing about the Senate report on the George Bush's George W. Bush government's use of torture right. in the post 9-11 war on terror. 
and how the, the basically the decision of the uh, Obama administration at the time was you know, release this report or at least partially release the port report, but they weren't going to pursue prosecutions. And I remember thinking to myself, so why is it that Peru or Guatemala, countries with historically very weak institutions, weak judiciaries, how come they can prosecute their presidents? who commit gross violations of human rights, and we can't do that. So actually, I spun off a little editorial about that, and I got it published in a few places, because it really, as an American, didn't it really, it really, it really bothered me that, why, why, can, why can't we muster the courage, right, to hold our leaders accountable when they violate the law and when they violate international law, whether it's George W. Bush, whether it's Obama, whether it's uh, Trump in any of them. Right. 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 Now, just so people sort of get an understanding, because I, I don't want anyone to walk away going like, oh, you know, Alberto Fujimori went to jail for human rights abuses, whatever that is. Can, can you just explain what some of the things he actually uh, did so we can get a better picture of of why Absolutely. why this was such a horrible dictatorship. That's a great that's a great question actually. So let me just start with the, the cases that he was actually prosecuted for. There are numerous other cases that he was not prosecuted for. He was prosecuted for essentially four cases. One was a massacre that occurred in Lima in 1991. Um, the the a special military essentially a death squad. It was called the Colina Group. It was essentially operated as a death squad, but it was comprised of all of military officials. And it was controlled by Montesinos and Fujimori directly. They believed that um, there was this uh, party organized for one afternoon, and they believed the members of that party were all members of the Shining Path. And they wanted to send a message to the Shining Path. And so they literally organized this massacre. They went in, had silencers on their machine guns, and they just opened fire. And they murdered 15 people, uh, wounded a couple. They left one person um, paraplegic. Uh, and among those killed were, was an eight-year-old boy. Okay. The fact is, these people had absolutely nothing to do with Shining Path. The, the intelligence was wrong, number one. But number two, even if they were members of Shining Path, in a democratic government, you arrest them, you bring evidence against them, and you prosecute them and you send them to jail. You don't just go in and murder them. Right. That's called extrajudicial execution, right? That's a human rights violation. The second major case that he was prosecuted for in, was the next year, um, there was a bombing in downtown, uh, 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 sort of middle class part of Lima, in which 21 people, all civilians were killed. And this was a, a Shining Path bomb. So the military, this same military unit that I'm talking about, the Colina Group Military Death Squad, decided to do a reprisal attack. And they went to the Cantuta University, which is in the outskirts of Lima which is a teacher's university, and they picked out ten, uh, nine students and one professor who they imagined, again, erroneously, were members of Shining Path and, and kidnapped them and then later executed them. To this day, only the partial remains of five of those people have been found. The remains of the other five remain missing. Um, so that's the second case. And the other two cases were um, kidnappings. Right after that military coup, that, that self coup that I talked about in 1992, mm -hmm. when Fujimori took total power and shut down the Congress and all that, um, a journalist, a very well-known journalist from Peru named Gustavo Goriti, who had extensively been investigating Montesinos and the role of the military, was kidnapped and held in communicado. He was really because of intensive international pressure. And a, a businessman, Samuel Dyer, was also kidnapped and eventually released. So those are the cases that Fujimori was convicted of. But there were thousands of cases of what, what is called improved forced disappearance, meaning the military, the security forces, essentially detain or kidnap you, 
and then you're never heard from again. They provide no information to your family. They deny any knowledge of what happened to you. Sometimes they kill you and bury your body in a mass grave. Sometimes they throw your body in the ocean, that sort of thing. And there are mass, mass, massive use of arbitrary detention, torture, sexual violence, and, 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 and outright uh, assassinations. So those are the kinds of things we're talking about. I, I, it's worth mentioning that Fujimori is currently facing charges for a different kind of human rights abuse during his regime called forced sterilizations. Right, right. I heard about this. Yes. So um, in the second half of his uh, government, the second half of the 1990s, uh, his government was intent on trying to reduce poverty. And one of their, you know, sort of, you know, very Nazi-like plans was to reduce poverty by preventing mostly Andean indigenous men and women from having babies, by forcibly sterilizing them without their knowledge or without their consent. And it's estimated that 300,000 men, most, mostly women, but also some men, were sterilized without their consent or without their knowledge. And so right now there's a proceeding going on that will, it's sort of the evidentiary phase hearing. So the court will determine whether there's enough evidence to send Fujimori to trial and three of his health ministers who oversaw this plan. Unfortunately, one of those health ministers was just elected to the Congress. So as soon as he becomes a congressman, in theory, he will have immunity and will no longer face charges. Unbelievable. Uh yeah. Let's use this actually to to segue into uh, in this current day election, the, the one we're still waiting results for, uh, how the different areas uh, of Peru seem to have voted. And it seems like uh, the, those people who uh, who their their, you know, their grandmas or or great grandmas were, were sterilized by um, uh, Fujimori. Uh, they don't seem like they were the ones who voted for his daughter. They were not the ones right. who were his daughter. I mean, it's really kind of remarkable. Um, so Keiko ha comfortably won Lima, which is sort of the economic and political center of the country. Peru is a very um, uh, Lima-centric country, right? A lot of power is concentrated in the capital city. A third of the population lives there. Most of the wealth is concentrated there. And she won, I think it was on like 55, 58% of the vote in Lima. She was expected to win a little bit more. So there was a kind of a hidden vote because there are a lot of poor people in Lima who I think didn't want to tell pollsters that they were actually voting for Pedro Castillo. Right. Because okay. she if, won. From my, from my understanding, there are like areas like, um, like Callao where it's more of a, like a, you know, more, more, it's not a rich area like uh, the heart of Lima. There's also these, these, these areas that are, uh, they, they started out as land invasions. They, they used to be called barrios populares or shanty towns. Now they're, you know, more uh, consolidated districts, but there's a lot of poverty in these districts, right? Um, and I think that Castillo probably did a little bit better in, in some of those areas than a lot of people expected. And, and Keiko Fujimori also did okay in this sort of the northern coast of Peru, which is a um, very dynamic sort of uh, export uh, capitalist economy there. And she did okay in the northern jungle region. But the central Andes, the entire center of the country, and then the south, that was dominated by Pedro Castillo. I mean, dominated. There were... There were parts of, of, of those rural areas, Cusco, Ayacucho. These were the areas where the war was hit hardest, where poverty is deepest, where there are more indigenous people. He won 85, 88% in these regions. In fact, wow. one of the, you know, you, you've heard that Fujimori is now claiming fraud. One of their arguments for the supposed fraud is there are some um, voting centers where she got literally zero votes. And they're like, it's statistically impossible for her to get zero votes. Well, in fact, it is not statistically impossible. They just don't like you down there. Right. 
that people are having on Twitter and social media. It's it's very interesting. But what it shows is a country that is very deeply divided between the rural, more Andean, more uh, uh, economically left behind regions, and the, the 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 Lima and the northern coast, which are more you know what better off. The economy is a bit more dynamic and where political power is more concentrated. But this is not a new thing. If you look back at the 20, the 2016 elections were a little bit odd because it was two right-wing candidates facing off in the second round. But if you go back to the 2011 votes when Keiko Fujimori faced off against another sort of leftist nationalist leader, Ollanta Mala, it was a very similar map. Ollanta Omala did very well in that Andean corridor and in the south, and Keiko did much better in the north and in Lima. So this is not new. Um, it's just that I think Pedro Castillo, um, somehow he captured it a little bit. I don't know. He, he captured it in a way that I think was surprising for many people. Right. A lot of people underestimated him. First of all, first of all because he's a, a virtual novice to party politics. He's never held political office of any kind. He was a school teacher and he was involved in the teachers trade union, which is the most powerful and important trade union in Peru. So that's not nothing. That's not no political experience, but it's not party politics experience, right? So he doesn't have that politics experience. Um, he's not, he wasn't really the member of a of an organized, organic political party either. He basically became the candidate of a political party because the president of that political party himself could not run because he was convicted of, cor of administrative corruption. So somehow they came to an agreement for Pedro Castillo to be the, the candidate. And I don't think that Pedro Castillo himself quite expected to catapult into the second round vote and then uh, to become the new president of Peru. So it's, you know, it is quite a surprising turn of events, I think. Right. And, and you know, his, his, uh, his like party logo is the pencil, right? He is a, it's like a, so it's, it's, brilliant. yes, it's, it's a smart it's a move. Brilliant. Right. It was a brilliant, um, symbol. Right. Uh, because, and, I, and I'll tell you one reason I think it's so brilliant because, um, and anthropologists have writ have written books and books and books about this, about how your average Peruvian sees education as the key to getting ahead. And maybe I can't educate myself, but I can sure as heck make sure I'm going to educate my kid so they can get ahead. And so that pencil, that symbol of education, was really very well thought out. Right. And I see you himself as a teacher. It just, it symbolically, it was very potent, I think. Uh, more potent than I think most people realized. Right. Now, and I've seen some some criticism, valid criticism of Castillo. And, you know, I, I want to also say that, you know, I feel like there are people out there who, who take this criticism and then try to equate him to uh, the right wing politics of the daughter of a dictator. And I don't think it's equatable at all, but I still think, you know, it's important to still talk about someone's failings in order to hopefully, uh, you sure. know, a left in Peru uh, can push him left on those issues where he seems to not be so left on. And it seems like sure. he, he, he happens to be, uh, while very left on economic issues, which is great, uh, he seems to be more of a social conservative. And I've seen people... Uh, wave that off as you know that's just that's just where Peru is as a whole. I've seen some people say, well, that's not true either. So, so where where is he on that, and and on what specific issues? And is that true that he's aligned with you know the majority of the 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 uh, his voters even? Right. So, I mean, I do think that I mean it's important to keep in mind that Peru is a heavily Catholic country, right? Um, and we all know that Catholic social teachings, especially in Latin America, tr tends towards very conservative, right? So just for example, reproductive rights, it's not something that most Latin American women have, in part because the Catholic church holds so much power that governments are not really willing to go that go there. And a lot of people believe 
in the teachings of the Catholic Church. So there is a deep social conservatism in Peru. That said, one of the other leftist candidates in the first round was Veronica Mendoza of the um, uh, Juntos por el Peru, Together for Peru party, um, who, on the contrary, is not a social conservative at all. Um, she's pro-reproductive rights, pro-women's rights, pro-LGBTQ rights. Um, and guess what? She didn't get very many votes at all. In fact, she got far fewer votes than I think a lot of people expected her to get. Was it because of that? Was it because of something else? I can't say. But certainly Peru is a very socially conservative country. And I think it's, I almost think it's gotten a little more conservative over the years. Um, just a few years ago, I don't know if you've heard about this in Latin America, there's this whole movement connected to evangelical churches, but also um, conservative Catholic uh, churches as well, called, um, uh, well, there's different names for it, I guess, in different countries. In Peru, it was called Conmigo No Te Metes, Do Not Mess With My Kids. And it's basically opposing gender perspectives or what they call gender ideology as some kind of Satanistic, leftist, you know, conspiracy. So there has been a lot of pushback by conservative groups, both connected to the Catholic Church, to evangelical church, and just conservative groups in general, um, pushing back on some of the inroads that feminist groups, uh, gay rights groups, and others have made in places like Peru and elsewhere in the region, right? Um, Argentina, uh, was it last year or earlier this year? I think it was earlier this year. They, um, passed, uh, a right to abortion for women, which is huge in Latin America. Uh, Peru is nowhere close to any of that. So I think in some ways, Castillo, that connects with, a, you know, a segment of his voting public. Um, but to, in the end, I don't think that's what people were voting for. I think what people were voting for when they voted for, for Pedro Castillo, for the teacher, for the pencil, they were voting for someone who said, Peru is a rich country, and yet it's filled with poor people. And his motto was, no more poor people in a rich country. All right. And that is something every Peruvian learns. I mean, Peru is a country with great wealth, with huge gold mines, silver mines, copper mines very rich agriculture, um, all kinds of natural resources, oil, gas, and yet poverty levels are intense. The, you know, and interna internationally, um, you know, international banks and, and, and whatnot talk about the Peruvian miracle, the high economic growth rate in the, in the between sort of the 2000s up until just before the pandemic, who had very high levels of economic growth, partly because there was a commodity boom globally. Um, uh, but where did that go to? Right. That was not distributed among the bulk of the population. A small group of people, a small sector of the population benefited from that. And the vast majority didn't see any, any benefit from it at all. In fact, you know, Peru has been, since the Fujimori government, it's been a very rigid um, neoliberal economic system where uh, the public sector has been shrunk so radically that, and I, and, I, and I do think it's important to talk about that because the pandemic has made this very clear. Peru has the highest fatality rate in the world. And that is because of the underlying failures of sort of the, the state to develop a, a robust sort of public health uh, system, also because something like 70% of the people live based on the informal economy. So what did we? What were we all told to do during the pandemic? We were all told to stay home. Well, if, you're, if your job is being a, a, a worker, someone who like goes out in the street and sells newspapers or sells pineapples or whatever it is that you sell, if you go home, you're not bringing in any income, you're not gonna be able to feed your family. So a lot of people simply weren't able to stay at home. So the pandemic hit Peru especially hard, I think in large part because of that. Not because the public sector health, the public sector in general has just been so uh, uh, shrunk because of the neoliberal model that was put in place 
uh, under the Fujimori government, and that has really not been not been changed at all. Right, right. What you're telling me about how you know how per, how Peru's uh, economic boom was. It reminds me of like he, here in the U.S. when a president uh, proudly shows off like the jobs numbers or how the stock market's doing well. It's like, okay, well, who benefits from the stock market doing well? And when it comes to the job number reports, what, what jobs are we talking about when you're talking about people, uh, everyone having a job? Are they having a job that pays them a living wage or are they barely, you know, are they still living in poverty or getting, uh, you know, or on welfare, you know? So it, it's it's very understand. Like, I totally get what's what you're talking about. And I have um, I have a, a family in Peru who, who explained to me how, um, you know, there was a, a time where in, in Chile there was a real, and this probably still goes on a bit, where there was real uh, dislike, I guess, for Peruvians in that country because so many working class Peruvians were going to Chile for work. Right. And um, and what you tell me about the, the COVID, a uh, family also told me how they had to deal with one of the ways they dealt with COVID in Peru is, and I, I still don't understand what the thinking behind this was, but there was a, a, a system where, for example, on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, the men could go out and the women had to stay home. And then right. on the other days, it was the opposite. Women were allowed to go out and men had to stay home. What, do, you, do you know what the thinking behind that was? I don't understand. Effort. It was one way they could try to limit and control movement, right? I think that's the reason they right. did it that way. Um, uh, because they realized that people couldn't stay at home. And, you know, frankly, the government failed to really think through, you know, in this pandemic, with so many people dependent on the informal economy, what can we do to help people? One thing they could have done was provide monthly payments to families so they could stay home. They, they, I think they gave out one or maybe two payments. That was it. Sort of like, you know, we, we got something like that a couple here and there. Um, but something more systematic, which is something they've done in other countries, that could have been helpful. Right. Um, I have family in Peru as well. My sister-in-law got COVID just um, a couple of months ago. And um, my niece said to me, I'm not taking her to the public hospital where she would be assigned to go. She'll die there because they have no... They have no beds. They have no oxygen. She'll just die there. I'm better off trying to get her treatment at home. Right. And that's what a lot of Peruvians have had to do because there's just a collapse of, um, you know, a very anemic public health sector and, and the private public health sector, sorry, the private health sector is just astronomical. Right. Now, now uh, back to the, the election. Um we were talking a little bit before about uh, Keiko saying how there's been fraud. And is that is that basically um, and I actually saw on your your Twitter account that a cartoonist basically drew Keiko as the QAnon shaman uh, yes. talking about election fraud or and how, you know, the election was stolen from her. Um <laughs> Is that based on the rural votes coming in later? Is that where that accusation of fraud is, is solely coming from? Or is there anything else? I'll tell you, the, the, the accusation of fraud is essentially fake news. Right, right. Okay. So the elections authorities have now processed 100% of the voting acts. And Pedro Castillo... Uh, is is ahead of Keiko Fujimori by about 70,000 votes, about 0.4%. Now, that is a very slim margin. However, she lost in 2016 by 40,000 votes, an even smaller margin. Right. Peru is a very divided society. Okay. Um, but, you know, the inter there were international observers who monitored the Peruvian elections, at least three teams that I'm aware of, there may be others, all of them said that the ele they, they actually congratulated the elections authorities for carrying out such a clean and impartial elections process in the midst of the pandemic. Um, the elections authorities themselves found, you know, that everything worked more or less smoothly. There's always going to be um, voting acts or votes that are 
question like a four looks like a nine. So they're, they're not sure about that. So they leave that one to the elections authority to decide. They don't count that one. Um, or, you know, for other reasons, they're, they're, they're questioned. That, that always happens. And there are something around 400 uh, ballots like that that are questioned. But overall, um, the ballots were counted and the results are in. And I don't think, um, if you look at the ballots that were questioned in the process, there's no changing the outcome. However, what Keiko Fujimori is trying to do is after the fact, seeing that she's lost, is now claiming that there was fraud, that not the elections authority, but the uh, Pedro Castillo's party carried out some kind of systematic fraud, you know, and she wants to try to invalidate something like 200,000 uh, votes, w which is, it's completely made up. There's no substantive basis for her claims. This is widely agreed upon by all thinking journalists, elections officials, international observers, etc. that I've spoken to, read about, and, and so forth. It's the, 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 you know, there's just no evidence. Right, and if right. you look at some of the examples that they've thrown out, like when she had her press conference a couple days ago, claiming that there were indicators of fraud, first of all, when you think there's fraud in an elections process, there's actually a procedure that you go through. You call attention to the elections authorities. You don't have a press conference and call fraud and create a hashtag which is what she did, right? <laughs> right. Um, and secondly, um, the examples that she gave, all of them, none of them were real. They were made up. Um, for, for Just to give you an example, um, one example that they raised was a, 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 an elections um, a booth in or table, is what they call an elections table in Puno, which is a very heavily indigenous area. Um, where three members of the election, like so, individual citizens participate as um, uh, elections. I don't know what we call them in here in the U.S. I have no idea. You're like the person sitting at the table. You go and you decide they give you your piece of paper. Then you go and you fill out your form. Oh, right, right, right. right. So Just like election work, poll worker. Election yeah. workers. Yeah. Election workers. Um, and you, if you're called up, you're required to do it. It's like your civic duty. Like it's like jury duty. Uh, so oh, three, you, get, you get called in Peru. That's interesting. Because here, you you, it's it's totally it. volunteer. I mean, you get paid, yeah, but it's totally volunteer. If, if it was volunteer in Peru, no one would do it. That's why. It's, <laughs> it's Same with voting. It's a, it's a, a, voting is obligatory in Peru, which is one of the reasons why you have such a high turnout rate. Right. Because people don't want to have to pay a fine. Um, so um, three members of this one t uh, voting table had the same last name. So the Keiko Fujimori said that this was evidence of fraud because there were three members of a family at a same at a table, and that's not allowed. That's against the, the elections law. Well, no one had bothered to find out if they were actually family members. It turned out they were not actual family; they just happened to share the same last name. It's like having you know, three people named Smith at an election. That's not right. uncommon. It's it, it, it's widely so that's what happened. That was not an example of fraud. That and in fact. The, the, the three uh, individuals in question are now uh, asking Keiko Fujimori to apologize for um, accusing them of fraud and saying that they're going to um, sue her for defamation unless she oh, unless she apologizes. So, because sir, if you accuse someone of fraud in the context of election, you're accusing them of a crime. And if, if, the, if the elections authority believes that there is a crime, they have to investigate. Right. And it, it could lead to a prosecution or, or a fine or, or some other kind of sanction. So it's it's serious. Right. Does she have right? Rudy Giuliani going down there? Because it honestly sounds just like uh, Trump's big lie in a number very of ways. Similar. Not, she doesn't have a Rudy Giuliani. She has a hundred Rudy Giuliani. She has some of the best law firms in Peru have volunteered or who knows if they're being volunteered, if they're paying for them, who knows? Um, uh, young law students to go, and they've literally, this is their strategy, to go to the rural areas, the poorest areas, where they're more, and this is their, they're, they're talking, not mine, where they're more likely to find mistakes hmm. on the voting acts. And of course, those are also the areas where Castillo uh, wins, you know, 80, 85% of the votes. So they want to try to nullify, just simply eliminate, obliterate 20, 200,000 votes, and then that would put her ahead. That's their kind of 
uh, magical thinking is how I like to think about it. Because I, I honestly don't think, I mean, for proving, so her father in 2000 carried out an elections fraud. That's how he was reelected in 2000 for the third time. International observers withdrew. Actually, I was in Peru. I was um, a, a, one of the observers. And international observers withdrew from Peru because of the fraud that was so evident going on that allowed her father to take a third term until he fled a few months later because of the corruption charges that I talked about earlier. Um, so we know what elections fraud looks like. And when when the new democratic government was was uh, came into power after that, one of the first things they did was work to reform the Peruvian Elections Authority to make sure that there would not be a similar kind of, you know, mucking around with elections. Because elections are, as we know, the centerpiece of democracy. It's not the only part of democracy, but it is a key part of democracy. And so Peru has actually a very, you know, a very good elections authority and a, a relatively clean and, and, and fair elections process. So, um, which is good, right? Because there's a lot, I feel like there's a lot less room for her to get away with what she's trying to get away with. But all that said, she's still agitating her followers, some of whom are very fervent believers that their country is about to turn communist and that their mere existence as a, is in threat, right. right? And so she's whipped, and I know this sounds like a familiar playbook, right? She's whipped up a frenzy and so this is a situation we're in right now. And she's trying, she's mobilizing these people saying, you know, there's fraud here and we have to stop this. And what's going to happen when the elections authority goes through all the claims she said and they discard them, discard them, discard them, and still Pedro Castillo is president? What are these people going to do? Right. Will there be violence? Will there be, th this is what we don't know is going to happen. This is still uh, in, in the days or weeks ahead. Right. Best so case is scenario is they just dress up in Viking gear, right? I mean, <laughs> that's what happened here. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I think you know, when when I saw what was going on, when I, 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 you know, you told me a lot more detail about some of what these election fraud claims, these false claims are. But when I saw what was happening, where the the rural votes, which overwhelmingly voted for for the leftist, were coming in, I, I automatically thought back to what happened in Bolivia where basically you had the same dynamic where Morales had a strong supporter base in more rural areas where people are you know poorer and and are you know more blue collar working class type and those votes started to come in later because it takes a while to get to those votes That's right. and That's exactly right. but in that scenario and it doesn't seem like it's happened here and you could uh this would be a bad correction I don't want to hear this but it doesn't seem like uh, organizations like the OAS are biting the, you know, are taking the bait here, uh, or or however they did in Bolivia. I think it was more than just that. But um, you know, it doesn't seem like there is an inter uh, an international organization getting involved like they did in Bolivia because in Bolivia they basically said, oh, we think there's something weird here, and that ended up uh, creating what happened where Morales was ousted by a coup. You had a, uh, a, a Janine Añez come to power with her big Bible and, and, yes. and there were huge protests and and activists being Massacre, killed. Two major massacres. Right. By the Añez government. Yes. Right. And of course, I mean, obviously, by these international organizations getting involved and saying Morales it definitely did something weird here, which turned out not to be true later on. I was worried that, oh, we're going to this is we're going to see it again in Peru. But it, it doesn't seem like at this point that people are believing Keiko's claims. I don't think they are. I mean, so I don't know if you saw this today, but um, several former presidents of Latin America signed a letter. And I'm sure this was instigated by Mario Vargas Dios, the Nobel laureate, who in 2011 and 2016 led the anti Keiko Fujimori campaign, sided with her opponent, told Peruvians to vote for her opponent. Um, and this time he told Peruvians that they should vote for Keiko because he sees Pedro Castillo as a danger, as a new Venezuela, a new Cuba, a new shining path. Who knows? Um, uh, but this letter was. Uh, signed by these ex 
presidents, most of whom were sort of center or or right wing presidents, including Uribe from Colombia, for example. Um, and they said, we think the Peruvian elections authorities should not declare a winner until the final, you know, the final review of all the election, you know, the votes is done. So basically, they're taking Keiko's word at face value without really, um, right. which to me is really problematic, um, you know, and, and, and smacks of a kind of an interference in the elections process that, um, that is, again, it's based on magical thinking. It's not based on reality. Um, but I think the again, fortunately, the Peruvian elect, elections authority and Peruvian civil society is fairly robust. It's important to say that one of the reasons that Keiko lost in 2011 and again in 2016 and again in 2021 is because there is this broad coalition of people in Peru who understand what the Fujimori family represents. They represent authoritarianism. They re represent um, uh, a, a disregard for the rule of law and for the institutions of democracy um, and probably violations of human rights. Right. Right. And so there have been these mass protests in 2011, 2016, and you saw it again in 2021 of this anti-Fujimori Fujimori nunca mas, which means Fujimori never again. There's there's a there's a whole collective called Noah Keiko. They've been around for I don't know 15 years now. Um, so I think that that is important to keep in mind. This sort of robust civil society in Peru, um, which you know you can go on 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 the Peruvian. There are several sort of Peruvian uh, uh, news sort of uh, digital news media sites where people are kind of very smartly analyzing everything that's going on and helping us understand why this is not really a fraud. Why, what, and they're literally dissecting where the original claim of fraud comes from, how it goes through different filters and ends back up on Fujimori's desk as her saying this is how fraud happened. Right. So there's a very careful scrutiny of what's going on by civil society, and I think the elections authorities are also pretty strong. So I think that's partly uh, what what we're seeing here. Right. Now, now I, had, I had seen, I had read an article of yours from, I think, uh, just a couple of days ago, maybe, in the Washington Post, and I, I, I had planned on talking a lot more about Shining Path in, in, on, on this show, but we just didn't get around to it. So maybe you could come back in, in the future and we could just have an episode on, it's probably, probably we'll, we'll take up a whole episode on Shining Path. But um, it, it, you, your article basically talked about how suddenly during this election, Shining Path was was inserted into the the campaign trail, where right. uh, where and, and it, again it seems like I guess uh, not the equivalent at all, not equating these two groups whatsoever, but it seems like just how uh, Trump found a, uh, a a nemesis in Antifa. Uh, Keiko saw one in Shining Path, or at least the media saw one in Shining Path, and something happened a couple of weeks ago where there was they a massacre. There was a massacre in a small jungle town in Viscatana, a district in uh, in an area called the Vraim, which is sort of the jungle region to the in in the eastern part of Ayacucho and surrounding areas. Um, it's a major drug uh, trafficking uh, region. The coca leaf, which is kind of a, a traditional part of Andean culture, but it's also the main ingredient in cocaine. The Peru's like seventy-five percent of the coca leaf from Peru is grown, and it's native to the Andes. It's native to Peru and Bolivia. Uh, it's also now grown in Colombia, maybe in Ecuador, but it's native to Peru and Bolivia. Um, so seventy-five percent of the coca leaf is grown in this area, and there's a remnant. So Shining Path was essentially um, defeated in the mid to late 1990s when its top leadership was arrested. Most of its followers were either they were either killed or they were arrested. Um, and the top leadership entered in this kind of weird arrangement with the with the Fujimori government where they urged their followers to um, 
put down their arms and to participate in sort of, you know, legal political life in exchange for his, you know, the, the leader of Shining Path wanted to have, you know, rights to visit his, his wife. That That's really what he wanted. Right. So, <laughs> um, so uh, Shining Path essentially, you no, know, it's not that it doesn't exist anymore, but it's not, it, politically it is absolutely insignificant. There's a tiny um, uh, group uh, called Movadef, which tried to get involved in legal politics, did not get very far. It's widely reviled. They follow Guzman, the head of the Shining Path. There are these remnant groups. One was in the Huayaga Valley, which is the northern jungle area of Peru. And then the other one is this Brahim region in the south jungle of Peru, the southeastern jungle of Peru. The Shining Path remnant group in the north was wiped out a few years ago when its top leader was captured, or maybe he was killed, I can't remember. Um, and it was disbanded. And this rump group continues to exist in the Vrime. They they have um, split from Abimai Guzman. He's the leader of the Shining Path who's in jail. They reject his idea of no longer participating in the armed struggle. They think the armed struggle should continue. But there's like a handful of them. They are basically stuck in this jungle region. And what they basically do is they, you know, they work with the drug traffickers. That's how they survive. So that's where this whole concept of narco, I don't like the term, but this concept of narco terrorists kind of emerged because it's a shining crap that has kind of a political, you know, uh, idea, but it's really all about the drug trafficking. So this is the group that the military claimed was responsible for this massacre, a very brutal execution style massacre of 16 civilians, including two children. Um, in front of uh, two bars that apparently were also um, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to say the word in English um, where you go to visit women what do you call oh, those? Like, like a brothel? I like or a brothel, thank you I don't know why that word didn't help <laughs> um, and uh, so the the military blamed the Shining Path for this massacre. When it was, it might have been this rump group of, of, of the former Shining Path, which is known as the militarized Communist Party of Peru, not the same thing as Shining Path. But a lot of people on the ground that have been interviewed since say that this was a, 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 some kind of a drug trafficking, kind of execution uh, reprisal kind of a thing. It didn't have anything. To, who knows? We don't really know. But the fact is the military published a statement saying it was Shining Path. Now, this was two weeks before the election, and you've got ongoing this red bedding campaign by Keiko Fujimori and by the mainstream media, which for all intents and purposes have become, in the context of this campaign, a propaganda machine for Keiko Fujimori. It's like, it's, it's as if all the television news stations in Peru were Fox News. And we're only favoring one candidate. That's what it was like in Peru. The only time you saw Pedro Castillo was, was, was on the, you know, kind of like the digital media. He was almost not covered at all. It's really, it was really quite incredible. Um, it, it actually reminded me of what it was like when Fujimori, the father, was in power. Because he mm. controlled all the media. In fact, his Montesinos wrote the news, the nightly news, right? Right. It was sort of like that. Um, so to say that Shining Path was responsible was to feed into this red baiting campaign that Pedro Castillo had connections with Shining Path. He had connections with Movadev, or he was connected to Cuba, or he was connected to Venezuela. You know, whatever stuck is sort of what they were portraying. Right. And did, um, it, did it work? Because it, I, I remember reading that Castillo was, was higher in the polls before this happened. So it seemed like oh, maybe he had, he had a 20 point lead at the beginning of the camp. So at the end of the first round, he had a 20 point lead. And as time went by, it was about about eight weeks between the first round and the second round. His his um, lead just declined to absolutely nil. So as the election was starting to, as the actual vote was happening, they were in a statistical dead heat. And I do think that this red baiting campaign had a lot to do with it. But what we see in election results is that it was 
very effective perhaps in Lima among sort of middle class and upper class people. And in the areas of Peru that were hardest hit by terrorism, where I think where some people might have thought that this campaign would have would have had more resonance, it didn't stick at all, which is extraordinarily interesting to me. Right? So Ayacucho, Puno, Cusco, regions that were very hard hit by violence, voted 80, 85. 89% for Pedro Castillo. That's it's incredible that he he won by that much in some areas. It really is. It's incredible. But I think it's it's also important to th to keep that in mind that it Peru is a country that is deeply divided and these are divisions that kind of are mutually reinforced by class, by race or ethnicity and by region. So you have Lima in the north which is uh, I'm not going to say it's Lima is all white because it's not all white, but there's sort of European colonial, you know, right. settler colonialism, right? And there's a lot of people who come from the rural areas who settled in Lima as well. Um, but it tends to be whiter, especially more middle class and more upper class you are. And then the Andean region. So like there's this kind of, Re mutually reinforcing cleavages based on race, class, and region. I always tell this to my students, the, the whiter you are, the better off you are in a place like Peru. And the darker skinned you are, probably the, the less better off you are. And that's part historical, right? It's a part of a legacy of colonialism, Spanish colonialism, and 300 years of Spanish colonialism. But it's also a legacy of 200 years of republicanism, of, of, of the Peruvian Republic. And this year is the 200 year, it's the bicentenary in Peru, right? Since its independence, uh -huh. which government after government has not addressed these deep divisions of race and class and region. Right. I mean, it, it's it, it seems like there, I mean, I, I, I know from, from talking with people too, that, that you know, there's a real racism between Peruvians so like like you're explaining like you know Peruvians I mean they even you know they, they have they have names they call them people who live as they say you know in, in the mountains uh, you know and, and it's a real I mean even even uh, even with the and there's a as we see with uh, the Fujimori family's success success in Peru there's a, a large uh, Japanese um, uh, population in Peru and you know, even uh, Fujimori supporters, if I'm not mistaken, like they chant at him or uh, her, I should say, or maybe they did it with him too. Uh, Chino, Chino, Chino. Even though they're they're not Chinese, oh. right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a very okay. This is a very interesting. I don't know. It's a very interesting Latin America phenomena, I think, um, uh, wh whereby. Your ethnicity, it's very disconcerting, especially in these days where we're very conscious of racial discrimination and racial disparities, where someone who's, you know, Afro-descendant, their nickname is Negrita or Negrito. Right. That's just weird to me, but it's not uncommon in places like Peru. And so people of Asian descent, whether they're Japanese, Chinese, Korean. Taiwanese, right. it doesn't matter, they're called Chino. And it's... Fujimori calls himself Chino. It's bizarre, but he was Jap of Japanese descent, but he calls himself Chino. It is one of those very bizarre things that that, that anthropologists are needed to help us fully understand, I think, right? Right. Um, but it is true. In 1990, when Fujimori was running uh, off in the second round against Mario Vargas Llosa, who is a patrician, white, European descended, upper middle class Peruvian, you know, a writer, right, um, against this Japanese immigrant uh, who was, a, you know, an agricultural uh, professor at a, at a small university in Peru. Um, and I remember there were the, sort of the, the upper class white ladies from the rich neighborhoods in Lima uh, organized street protests against Fujimori, and they were extraordinarily racist. And a lot of Japanese Peruvians were very worried. They, they, and they would say, you know, we've kept a very low profile because we're afraid of racism, racist attacks against us. 
And Fujimori, he's like in the public eye now. And now, you know, if things go bad with his government. We're going to be, we're going to suffer the consequences, that kind of thing. So there were those racist attacks. But it's interesting how in this electoral process, despite her Japanese ancestry, Fujimori was embraced by the elites because she represented um, the status quo. The status quo that they believe in, that they benefit from, against someone from, right, rural Peru, from the indigenous part of Peru, um, who they're terrified of. Right. That's just the bottom line. And this is a long thread in Peru's history. You know, the the wealthy Lima white elites terrified of the poor indigenous masses. You know coming to claim their due and right. I, you know that's there's a little bit of that at play here i think right yeah i mean from what i understood of castillo and i'm sorry for going so late i know i told you uh well beyond but this has been such a fascinating conversation so we'll we'll wrap it up here but i want to just end it with you know, what what is so so with it looks like castillo is going to win and so so what what is it that we th that that is is uh you know by people who aren't Fear mongering, or you know, listening to what Keiko is saying and what her party and what the right in Peru is saying. What what is it most likely that he will do once he gets into office? First of all, will he even have the power to do it with with the rest of uh, Peruvian lawmakers? I mean, what is it look like? And you know, knowing how Peru is, will he even will he even make it to the end of his term? I mean, I can't. Who is the last Peruvian president to serve a full term? I don't even. I, I don't even know. <laughs> well, Ocanto Mala served his five years. He, okay. He, and then he went to jail. He was arrested. <laughs> but every living president, except for the um, dictator from the 70s, uh, either has been charged, is in jail, or is wanted for corruption. And one uh, killed himself as he was about to be arrested on oh, charges. Right. Of I remember this, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So there's that, the whole corruption thing. I think we haven't hardly even touched upon that. But um, uh, so one thing that is clear that if Castillo uh, uh, is seated as president, as I expect he will be, um, he has a very small caucus in a very divided Congress. He has something like 37 members uh, of his party in Congress. And even if some of the left and center left parties caucus with him, they don't get anywhere near <laughs> um, uh, the kind of majority they're going to need to carry out major policy changes. And he's going to face a number of very conservative parties, Keiko's party and the two other right wing candidates who got, they were third and fourth in the national vote. So they have large, you know, not not huge, but they have large caucuses in Congress as well. So if those three and a few others combine, they have something like 70, 75 votes in Congress. It's not quite enough to overturn, to, to remove the president, but it's not very far. You require, a, there's 87 votes in the current configuration of the Congress. You need 87 out of 130 votes in Congress to remove a president based on this ambiguous category called moral incapacity, which has been abused. And this has been a, an ongoing conversation people have had after what happened last year, three presidents in a week. Um, but uh, I have no doubt that Keiko Fujimori and her allies will try to use that to remove Castillo as soon as they can. I don't think they have the numbers right now, but they might be able to build those numbers. Who knows? Um, so he's going to have a very hard time he, at the same time, he's promised change, um, and he's going to want to deliver. He's promised to um, basically establish a constituent assembly to write a new constitution. There's a lot of concern about that, both because of uh, concern about who would be the constituents writing a new constitution, how representative would they be, um, what kind of constitution are we going to get from someone who's expressed homophobic sentiments, anti-women sentiments. So there's some concern about that as well. Um, but he's going to have a rough time of it because, and there's also, um, within his own party, there's disagreement. Right? Throughout the campaign, one of the things that people have expressed concern about is 
the president or the executive secretary of Peru, uh, Peru Libre, Free Peru Party, whose name is Vladimir Serrón. He was a governor, I believe, of Junín, a center uh, Andean uh, department. He was convicted of corruption, sentenced, I think, to four or five years, which is the reason he couldn't run for president. He wanted to run for president. He wasn't able to. Um, and many of the uh, Congress people elected by Peru uh, Libre to Congress are loyal to him. And uh, uh, Castillo has had to try to distance himself from Cerrón to bring in other support. So you see what I'm saying? He's got a bit of a, he's got a rough time of it within his own supporters. Like whether he's going to even be able to hold his own supporters together is a question. Let alone, you know, the right wingers who are going to come barking at the door to bring him down. So I'm afraid of very, um, you know, it could be a very unstable period ahead. I hope that um, cooler heads prevail, but given the polarized nature of this campaign and given Keiko Fujimori's own history, I mean, she's the reason we had three presidents in a week. She refused right. to recognize her loss in 2016 and her determination was to bring down that government. They censored ministers. They, they, um, they shut down cabinets. They removed two presidents and a third was, uh, you know, he, he, he was basically booted out after all those protests. So, um, she knows how to do obstruction. So th she th knows th how to destroy does the does the does the so does the right sort of in Peru sort of revolve around her in the same way uh, the right here now revolves around Trump? Like, is it the same sort of dynamic? Wow, it's interesting that you ask that question because in the first round election, there were three right wing candidates that got a lot of attention. One was an extreme right wing Opus Day uh, businessman who benefited from Keiko Fujimori's father's economics. Uh, and, and there might be some, I don't know, there's some question of corruption there, but I don't know the details of that. Um, uh, but he's extremely conservative on all levels. But he got, he came in third. The the fourth vote getter was Hernando Castillo, uh, Hernan, sorry, Hernando de Soto, the father of, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurial capitalism, the idea that uh, we all just need to have a t title to our land, become, you know, rich. Um, uh, and those three were sort of disputing leadership. And it, at, at some point, I think people believed that one of those two were going to defeat Keiko. And in the end, the hardcore supporters of Keiko Fujimori uh, pushed her into the second round. Right. So um, I think there are people among the Peruvian right who would like to disassociate from Keiko because they see that in the end, it's all about her. And she might be, in the end, very bad for business. This is sounding very familiar. Right? She's ultimately what they're interested in. But for others, they don't see an alternative. <clears throat> she brings a cohesion and the name recognition, right? It, it's very familiar. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope, I, at least, first of all, this has been an absolutely fantastic discussion. I, I've, I've learned a lot, and it's, it's really great. And I hope people who are watching understand, well, number one, it's important to know about what happens in the all over the world, but number two, also, it's important to cover. I I, I think it's been happening in, in the, over the past you know decade or so, where we've been seeing a rise in a far right authoritarian uh, you know uh, movement all across the world. Really, you know, you if you want to talk about South America, look at uh, Lula being imprisoned and uh, Bolsonaro coming to power. Um, Correct. You can look Kelly and El Salvador. Right. Right. Shutting down, Congre uh, shutting down uh, 
the constitutional court, firing the attorney general. Right. And he don't get me started on his latest with Bitcoin. I'm ready to go off on that. That's just, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, even elsewhere with, uh, you know, Modi in India. I mean, they, they, I, I think and it's become really clear, I think, that even if they're not directly like, you know, if there's not some sort of like back channel communication where all these different movements and governments and leaders are all all talking and it's pretty clear that there is a playbook that they're all at least paying attention to and seeing what's successful what's not and you know learning and uh gaining power from that and at least it seems like in south america uh th those uh you know th that that uh that authoritarian wall is starting to be chipped away by leftist leaders coming to power you know even just with the bolsonaro example uh lula getting out of jail and it seems like he's going to uh run against bolsonaro and probably win and you know you see in bolivia even though there was a, a right-wing coup there and you know morales couldn't run again his successor ends up once again right. uh, winning in an even more uh decisive victory than morales originally did um and i, I think you know i, I think there it's pretty clear that you know this stuff should be paid attention to even if you don't if you're not really into international politics, which you should, of course should be, but if you're not, it's important because we saw similar things happen here, um, and still happening here. It's not. It's not. We're not. We're far from done. Uh, I think it's actually going to get even worse before, uh, if it ever gets better. But um, Dr. Joe Marie Burt, associate professor of political science and Latin American studies at George Mason University and senior fellow at the Washington Office on Latin America. And of course, as you all saw, uh, an expert on Peru. Uh, she's written a number of books. Um, is there anything specific you'd like to promote anywhere people can follow your work? Feel free right now to, to do all that. Oh, J Twitter is where it's at. Um, and Twitter at J Joma Burt, J O M A B U R T. Thank you so much for joining me tonight, uh, Joe Marie. Really appreciate it. Absolutely uh, great conversation. Uh, hope to have you on again in the future. To have, at least uh, I'm sure there'll be more to talk about. But if anything, I wanted to go you more. You cut into out a second shiny. there. Um, oh, I, I said. Uh, there you go. You cut. I, okay. Uh, well, now that I'm back. Uh, I would love to talk more about Shining Path, and of course, if any uh, updates when we uh, know them from Peru in the in the future, I'd love to have you back on. Would be happy to do that. This is really fun, Matt. Nice, nice talking with you, and thanks for having me on. Have a great night. Thanks. You too. Bye bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, really great. I really enjoyed that discussion. Um, I see people in the comments. Uh, really uh, uh, enjoying this discussion. Um, also, I saw some people talk about, I, I didn't want to bring the word up because I know there's different feelings about it, uh, how indigenous people in Peru are referred to as uh, cholos and cholas. Um, I, I see Renee says it's the equivalent to like, you know, the N-word over there, but then I see other Peruvian people saying it's not, it's sort of like an, uh, you know, uh, I, I actually know that word. I know people who are called uh, Peruvian people, I should say, born, raised, lived, or live in currently Peru, who use the term uh, as a term of endearment, endearment, excuse me, cholita, cholito. So I know it's all over the place there. Sort of like what um, uh, Joe Marie was talking about with uh, with uh, the term for uh, uh, Afro-Latinas in Peru, uh, uh, negrita. And I know that there's a uh, Peruvian snack food where there is their their um their logo is a Peruvian black woman and they refer to her as uh, Negrita. I think the food is even called that or something. The like the snack bar. Um a lot of Peruvians in my life. <laughs> um so yeah, uh, I, ho I hope you enjoyed that discussion too. Uh I'm going to really try to do more uh on not only what's going on in Peru but I think there is some real, you know, you guys know this show. You know what I cover on this show. We sometimes do some other stuff, but the the main bread and butter of the show that I'm, that's my specialty is focusing on uh, the right wing, conspiracy theories, uh, fake news, misinformation, and how it affects politics, society, culture, technology. Um, and I, I think in Latin America and South America, we are seeing a real, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if it's a like a, a unified front in all these countries, uh, but 
it's happening. We're seeing a real movement against some of these right wing factions in South American and Latin American countries. Again, like we were talking with Joe Marie, there are still obviously countries where uh, there are problems and uh, their right is in power there. But we are seeing uh, some leftist blowback. And I think it's important to cover these things. So, uh, again, like I said, there is an international far right. Uh, again, don't know if it's unified, but movement going on. And they're definitely taking pages out of their playbook. Look at Keiko and her big lie, we can call it. And, you know, this isn't completely new, but I do feel like it's been especially emboldened over these, this past decade or so. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing more of that on this show, for sure. Um, we're going to go to the second half of the show now. If you're watching live on the live stream, you can stick around. I will be taking calls. Uh, I will be uh, playing some clips, reading your comments, your questions in the chat. The only way to guarantee, because there's so many questions and comments in the chat, I try to get to as many as I can, but the way to guarantee it, and also to thank me if you enjoyed a specific episode, is to send a super chat. It's like a one-off donation on YouTube live streams uh, where basically it highlights your chat, and I make sure to read those chats. Um, and I will read them in the second half of the show. Um, you can also support this show, if you can, by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash mattbinder. Uh, if you can afford to do so, it would be really appreciated. Uh, I'm really trying to grow this show. We've been stuck at this current patron level for like two months now. Every time we gain a few, we lose a few due to like charge, uh, not uh, 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 credit card. Uh, does not, what is it called? Deny. Like, someone gets. Uh, I'm having a mental block right now. You know what I'm talking about? Not chargebacks. No one's charged back on this show, thankfully, so far. But. Um, you know, when people have problems with their card or, or, or for financial issues, people have to cancel, which, again, I stress. If, if you are uh, having financial issues or, or struggling, you know, with this pandemic still going on, uh, or the regular modern life problems, uh, totally take care of yourself and your family first. Uh, and, you know, if, if you can't afford to become a member, a uh, patron, then I really appreciate that. Patreon.com slash Matt Binder. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Matt Binder. Follow me on Twitch, Twitch.tv slash Matt Binder. This show is simulcast on both YouTube, Twitch, Facebook. I don't even think Periscope is working anymore because Twitter shut it down, but it usually it should be on there, but I'll figure that out. I'm going to probably start simulcasting on more places. I'll let you guys know where. I also plan on doing a little bit of trying to separate the YouTube and the Twitch. But uh, for now, it's all simulcast. Same show on every platform. Also, follow me on Twitter, at Matt Binder. Instagram, at Matt Binder. Um, I will be uh, setting up... Uh, what else? Uh, search me anywhere, Matt Binder. You'll find me. Um, a, a, uh, a buddy of mine uh, has a uh, TikTok uh, channel he's not using with a few followers that... Uh, they're going to give me and uh, I'm going to use that because I never got on TikTok. I have you no. Know, and they were like, you want to, you want this? I'm not using it. I was like, yeah, I got no, I should probably start up because I'm now tracking TikTok a lot because on another episode, I have an episode planned where I'm going to talk about how TikTok's becoming a major spot for conspiracy theories. It's becoming like viral content on there. It's not just like a play to spread uh, your own political ideology and try to convince people with disinformation and misinfo. It's literally becoming like a viral content meal for conspiracy theories, which honestly is actually kind of worse because people are spreading these conspiracy theories without any thought behind what it's doing. Um, just for the clicks, just for the views, just to become uh, viral on TikTok's for you page. So I got to get on there and this app, someone was like, yeah, take this. So I'm going to set up on there. I'll tell you guys where to find me on there soon. Um, uh, what else? What else? What else? Uh, oh, uh, rate this podcast.com slash doomed. Go to rate this podcast.com slash doomed, and on that page, you will find links to where you can leave reviews to the podcast version of the show, which you can find at doomedcast.com. But if you go to that rate this podcast uh, page, uh, you can leave a, a, a review at Apple Podcasts. I think another one's Podchaser. Wherever you can leave a review for the podcast, leave a review. I'm telling you, those reviews actually do work. And I'm going to read. I did this last week, and people uh, sort of uh, enjoyed that I did that. 
Um, let me read the latest review on the Patreon on the uh, the Apple Podcast page. Uh, leave a review. I'll read yours next week. Um, the latest review comes from do, 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 do. Abby Normal, ah, regular listener of the show. I re- I notice her. Uh, I recognize her screen name. Uh, Doomed Pod, best pod. Matt is a rad punk lefty who hosts excellent, well-researched interviews. His down-to-earth nature makes his show so enjoyable to watch and engage with. Five stars. Hell yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, Abby, for the uh, Apple Podcast review. Uh, And patrons, thank you so much. I'm going to name the latest, give a shout-out to the latest patrons on the show let's see here we got chx misty thank you for becoming a patron frank h thank you for becoming a patron hell me thank you so much for becoming a patron and nam de net thank you so much for becoming a patron i noticed there's a few uh people who used to be patrons who came back which is a great honor honestly to see that because it means uh you know you you left the show for uh reasons that weren't you hated it and you came back as soon as you could which is honestly even you know it mean that actually means more to me than like you know uh you know someone uh become becoming a new member even though i enjoy new members as well don't get me wrong but uh you know it means you guys uh came back came back home uh all right folks we're going to the second half of the show now there'll be a lot more of this show to come I'm going to take a quick, like, not even a minute, a couple seconds to uh, refill my drink so I can keep going. And uh, we have much more to talk about. Give me a second. If you are watching live or if you are a patron, you will see this all. Otherwise, this is where I say farewell and see you all next time on Doom. All right, we are back. Give me one second. There's a uh, looks like there is some uh, one. Let me fix the uh, the screen here. Uh, you know, second half of the show, a little bit more laid back. But give me, I gotta fix the screen. There's a little bit of a uh, gotta uh, probably pan in just a little bit to get rid of that issue. All right, let me see if I fixed it. There was a uh, something going on with the green screen. I think it's fixed. I think it's fixed. Let me give it a little bit more leeway on this side. Ah, I think I, I think, I think that should be good. Boom! I think I got it. All right, folks. Thank you so much for sticking around. We got lots more show. Let me log into the, um, the call system for Skype because I, you know, I have to use a different. Can't have people interrupting the guests, so I have a different Skype username that I use for guests, obviously. Um, so give me one second to log in to the uh, Skype here. You can call into the show at Doomed Live on Skype. 
I'll find ways to... I know people requested Discord. I will get around to that, I promise, setting up Discord. But right now, what I'm using is basically Skype because it is built into the... Um, the uh, live streaming software I use has direct uh, Skype integration, which makes life a lot simpler for me. I mean, I can easily set it up, but, you know, when I am um, trying to uh, host the show and as well produce the show, I need to um, do whatever is easiest, to be quite honest. And let me take this first call from... Uh, Renee, is that you? Yeah. Give me. Oh wait, I think I just took. Whoa, I think I just took both your calls somehow. My bad. You're both. On, I don't know how I did that, but um, Renee, uh, are you there? Uh, do you do, do you hear John? All right, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, John, why don't you hang up and then I'll I'll take you after Renee. Yeah, there I you think. go. No, he couldn't. You couldn't hear each other, which isn't going to work. Obviously, I'll figure out how to make that work next time. I don't know okay. how that happened. Basically, um, I took one of your calls, but it picked up both. I'll have to look into what happened there. But hello, Renee. How are you doing? So so. I mean, I've been in lockdown. I'm seeing both of us on the on the big screen because I have a bit of a lag. Um. Yeah, um, regarding the conversation, I think uh, to be real quick, I, I think the big the big uh, issue is to ask about where the loyalties of the military and the police lie. I suppose that's usually the case in the southern hemisphere, right? Well, right. I started I started asking that after cap after the attack on ca on the Capitol as well. Right. In the right. United States. Right, and it seems like here, at least here it was. Uh, uh, Interestingly, it seems like there was a, uh, it seems like there was a split actually between the police. I'm, I'm not saying you know. It seems like a lot of them did not like what uh, was going on, and a lot of them were also supportive of what was going on. Right. Uh, right. But and uh, and the other thing was uh, saying that uh, people were saying in the chat, and there's a sort of kind of flirtation that Trump is like, uh, I mean that Keiko was acting like Trump, and actually, it's vice versa because Keiko is just being the usual trust fund baby born into privilege and all that. Right. Yeah. And Trump is, and Trump as a, as a joke goes is the quintessential, uh, South American dictator and all but name that, uh, would have been a great African despot. Right. I mean, yeah, there's so many, and I'm sure you can say this for so many of these authoritarians, uh, especially the, the, the recent years, uh, it, they all seem to follow the same sort of it's it's like uh they're, they're mirror images of each other like when she was explain right. when when uh Dr. Burt was explaining some of the things about uh uh who Keiko was it was like Jesus this is this is this is the same thing we've heard uh, from you know from obviously Trump and then so many other world leaders who are on the right right but basically it's like um I mean, it's basically also like a, if a Kennedy continued to have support from the mafia, of course, uh, Robert burned those b bridges and all that. And of course, they didn't have like the same kind of uh, operative system as a, as a right back then. But I mean, um, yeah, I think patience zero would be like, uh, as I said previously, would be Berlusconi. Right. That's a that's that's a good. Yes. Right. That's a good point. Um, yeah. is is he patient zero? He's definitely one of the earliest ones, and I can't think of anyone earlier. So I think from yeah, just, it would be it would be like somebody probably. And what I mean, like when I, when I, when I, and I, I do understand what you're saying. When I mean early, I mean like we, we're talking modern day. Obviously, we can go back, and, of course, of course. But I, I do think he might be at least you know patient zero for the modern day uh, authority. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've also made the comparison to be more New York about it. With Boss Tammany, of course. Ooh, there, but that goes way back. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, thanks for the call, Renee. And I, I actually am kicking myself yeah, now for it. not specifically. I, I, she may have mentioned something about the police and the military early on. I can't quite remember, but I'm, I'm now kicking myself no, for not it, thinking of that. It would have been a more direct question. You also have regarding um, Southern Hemisphere politics. You always have to keep that in mind as a as a as a latent question, especially in terms of uh, of um, Bolivia. And even I questioned that regarding Chile. Uh, I'll talk even more, but I mean, it's basically everything else is in my super chats. And I'm sorry that I gave you the authorization to punch your mother-in-law for using the word cholo, but that's how I feel about it. Oh, no, it's not. It's not my mother-in-law who says that I could get, I could, uh, oh, I'm, I'm glad about that. Yeah. <laughs> it, might, it might be the other, the other one, but okay. I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put anyone on the spot. <laughs> Okay, but, but you is, have my it authorization. Is, it, it, it is, though, seen as from, I mean, obviously, even in the chat, there was uh, some disputing that. Um, no, not really. It was like kind of unanimously said as a bad word, and some people were actually offended by it directly, at least two. There's a guy that I want, that I want him to call in who's uh, Peruvian but living in the United States who's of um, Asian descent, of Chinese descent, but also has like Japanese family members. So it'd be like an interesting perspective on on the Japanese elite as like these new immigrant populations that become the elite in South America mm-hmm. as a sort of fluctuation of forces. As I was saying that Fujimori started to act like the new the new feudal elite, shall we say, because he inserted himself into power that way. Right. Especially with Montesinos' help. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll I'll cut off and leave. Some Thanks. breathing space for everyone else. Thanks for the call. I always appreciate it, Renee. And, and this time you were on point. And I'm going to read a lot of your super chat comments in a minute. Um, thanks okay. as always, Renee. Okay. Uh, John, who called in before, if you want to call back in right now, I can. Oh, we got another caller. So don't call back in, John. I got another call right now. Uh, I'll cut off the breathing. Uh oh! Listen, for I'm hearing the uh, delay in the chat. You're on the air. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. You just turn down the volume on your computer. Cause... I, I just, I just did. I just said sorry about that. No, I, don't, I was, don't I'm, worry I'm about delayed. it. Hey, uh, I'm that, I'm that guy that uh, Renee was <laughs> was talking about. I just <laughs> want, uh, I just wanted to call in because I have like a, yeah, I have a Japanese family and uh, they were super. It's it. It was. It's just so interesting seeing, like, essentially everything that happened here happened is happening in Peru almost exactly, including like, including K-pop armies like revolting against Keiko. Like even to that point, like everything is happening, like exactly like how it happened here. Right. Which is which is really weird. Um, yeah. So I think like a lot of. Uh, like a lot of this like anti Castillo stuff uh, is very much rooted in like just to, just co- like the colonial culture in Lima. I I, I hear a lot of uh, comments from friends and my friends uh, who I did not expect. Uh, maybe I should have, but I I just didn't expect when like full on right wing like nut jobs when it came to like Castillo and and Venezuela and communism and all that stuff, but. It's just uh, a lot of it is like all the comments that are being made about him are like, well, you know, this guy doesn't have the presence to represent us. You know, like there's there's a lot of that of like this indigenous person, you know, what is right. going to show up? And like, is he going to show up at the United Nations with like the hat on? You know, like there's right. a lot of like and and yeah, like the comments about the word uh, Cholo. Yes, they're used like, you know, have friends to be, you know, me and some friends would call each other like, or well, I don't, but like, they would be like, somebody would be like, hey, you know, Cholito, Cholito, like, kind of like what you said. Right. But like, being from Lima, and this is a story that I, that I shared in the chat, like, I went at one time a classmate just for no reason other than there was this dark skinned girl walking by. He just spit in her face and called her a chola. You know, Jeez. like, there's this like, there's this like, like strong resentment over being like just just being dark skin. There's uh, there's this uh, there's this thing that happens when you're born, which is really weird, honestly, considering like 
not a lot of us are white. You know, there's like there are white people, but uh, there's that's not the majority. But there's this weird thing that happens when you're born, where like, oh, you know, somebody would be like, oh, that their baby's so cute. They're so white. You know, right. that's like a that's like a that's like a theme for when like a kid is born and like they equate like whiteness with superiority even when you're not white and with uh with just being like good looking so there's a lot of that when it comes to the the whole castillo uh uh uh, just the way lima's like afraid of him it's not just like yes there's like the economic fears and all that but there's also this like deeply rooted racism right uh, when it comes to him and and it's not even if you're it's not even if you're you know, a, a native or, or indigenous or, or, you know, is, or, you know, it's nothing to do with that even just to really clarify what you're saying here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I know people who are, you know, basically the, the, the you know, the, the same, um, you know, uh, background, uh, you know, eth- uh, ethnic background who are Peruvian yet, mm-hmm. you know, yet, uh, one could be born with darker skin and their life is completely different on how they're treated based right. on the person with yes. the life. And that's, there's like no, you know, there's nothing in it even in terms of like difference in race. Obviously not saying that would be uh, okay either, but just to give you an example, right. just how bad, bad it is. Yeah, it's really bad. Like even, you know, even when, even when you watch TV, you kind of see the disparity there, right? Like there, there could be somebody with like absolutely no the TV experience, somehow they landed in Peru and they automatically make it on TV because of the color of their skin, and they're in like a prominent role. Like that, that is like a big thing that's always happened there. Um, as far as like the the whole Japanese thing, yeah, like my entire Japanese family is full on Fujimori. Uh, they, they, I mean, my my uh, my aunt, her uh, late husband, he he knew him. The the Japanese like uh, the Japanese in Peru are very much like very close knit, and they a lot of them know each other. Uh, and I guess they there's like a and especially in Lima. I don't know how it is like outside of Lima. I just I, I, I'm from there, so I don't really know how it is over anywhere else. But in Lima, there's like your Japanese schools, and, and that's kind of where where a lot of them go. And uh, so they they kind of they kind of know knew them knew him and the fujimoris and they're very much like it has to be like that and a lot of the and it's weird just seeing like a lot of the comments and a lot of like the things that they have said that are very much kind of like you know like just the the same the same the same thing that's the same things that are being said here about trump which is which and they hate trump which is the funniest thing a lot of them do you know right so they, it's just now. Are, is your family are they are they born and raised in Peru or did they? I mean, obviously, you know, they they came from Japan at some point. But um... uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, um, my cousins were born there, and uh, I believe my uncle was born there. But their their parents were like, you know, they came from Japan. Now, is there a di- uh, is there a difference in any in anything in terms of how they view things based on the, the, your family members who were born in Japan and, and came, and like the ones who were born in Peru? Like, do they all just view Fujimori the same, or does is it different depending on where they were? You know, if they were born in Peru or born in Japan. Uh, I was fairly surprised that the ones that were born in Peru were so so like so pro Fujimori, especially my cousins that are closer to my age. Um, but yeah, uh, I, they all, they, I mean, as far as my family goes, they have like close relationships with people in Japan and kind of, they have lived there too. So I don't know if there's like, you know, they, they, their culture, they pretty much maintain their culture. So it's not like there's so much, they're so disconnected, but I was just surprised because like, you know, I moved to the States when I was 15 and that was kind of like a year after the Montesinos video started going on TV. So like we all saw this. It wasn't like, it wasn't like a like a thing where like you know sometimes you you call somebody a, a a corrupted politician and you're like oh yeah they did this, but there's like no no way to kind of prove it, or or no like clear way to I guess prove it. We saw videos of them doing it. You know, like there were like countless of videos they just played on repeat, and it's just like. 
it's just it's just mind boggling to see like how strong Red Scare is in Peru. That I mean, that, I, I that, sort of I sort of understand it in, in a way. In terms oh, I do of, too. I because do too. unlike yeah. you know, I think I think maybe people who are unfamiliar with with Peru sort of. You know, there there are definitely countries where, like, obviously in the U.S., the Red Scare is bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like, nothing happened right. to make us no, hate. No, but in Peru, yeah. But in Peru, like, Shining Path literally was like. I mean, I've, I I know people who who are here today because they had to leave the. They needed to leave oh, the violence. Yeah. And and Shining Path, it's not like Shining Path was just going after like you know the 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 wealthy and the elite either. Like no no they no, were, no no I. They yeah, were that's literally a, that's a, just. That's a, they, sorry, they, go they, ahead. they 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 were ahead. like. You know, we, we could always talk about how, you know, sometimes violence is necessary from even like from leftist groups. But like when we talk about that, it's usually when it's uh, trained on the right people to have the issues with. But it, it right. really does, from my understanding of Shining Path and from everyone I've spoken to about it, they really were just indiscriminately killing people. Uh, didn't matter who. Um, yeah, I when I was a kid, I mean, I was I was old enough to to kind of be to kind of be alive by the end of it and and I remember I remember watching I believe I, I believe your guest by like who just nailed it 100 percent on everything she said I believe your guest like talk, kind of mentioned that I think I think she was talking about uh, Tarata I think that was the building that she was referring to right. it, it was a bomb it was a bombing that happened kind of by the end of Shining Path uh, and I remember seeing that on the news when I lived there and. And he, and there were times because they would also do these like kind of they would bomb all these like I guess like uh, power plants or like I don't know like uh, towers power towers or something like that. So we would lose power like every now and then. Um, but yeah, they went after everybody. It wasn't like a thing. And that's an argument that I have here with some people on the left who who kind of like you know like some sometimes they're like oh you know super based you know and I'm like well it wasn't. It wasn't that based. Like there were a lot right. of innocent people that died, and and it, it, it like you said, they just kind of killed every. Like yeah, it I didn't mean, matter. I mean, I think when people think of like leftist violence, uh, you mm-hmm. know, they, they think of you know leftist groups training this violence on the the people who who quite frankly, in many cases, deserve it. People who have right. for years and decades and and generations been inflicting that violence and poverty on. Uh, mm-hmm. those below them and uh, you know this left wing group would come in and then finally you know dish out some vigilante justice whether you agree with that or not that's on you that's totally I'm not here to have that discussion right now but I mean I mm-hmm. get it I totally get it uh, yeah. and, and, but uh, Shining Path is a case that I um, there probably is analogous groups out there I don't know about them off the top of my head but it does seem like Shining Path is in a distinct uh, a distinction of their own where they were basically, uh, you know, hurting people of their own class, of classes oh, below absolutely. them. Oh, that's, absolutely. Of... That's something that I think gets lost in the conversation uh, from the left here, that Shining Path also murdered people in, what, I guess, what we call the, the interior of the country, which is like the rural and jungle areas. They they, they murdered a lot of people there. Right. Um. So, so yeah, like, I, I just... You know, I understand. I, 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 I'm with you. I totally understand the red scare fears because, like, a lot of my family just lived through that. I mean, it's 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 important that hopefully someone like a Castillo can can break mm-hmm. break through and show people there that hey, Shining Path was again a thing of their own. They are not representative of the left. But I mean, it also shows that you know. Uh, Got to sort of be uh, careful uh, all over the world when a left wing group goes rogue, how it will affect uh, if or when I should say a left wing group group goes rogue, how it will affect the the public's uh, broad uh, sense of who the left is and what they are and what they do. I mean, people, we we need to be aware of that. I know people are probably like, oh, we want us to police the left. Well, I mean, no, but unfortunately, the way the world works is messaging and and how you're viewed publicly means the world to people who aren't in these bubbles and don't understand all the intricacies. They just read the, the you know, the mainstream news headlines and see what's going on, and that's where they get right. their worldview. Uh, we need to do the best we can to to have an accurate portrayal of what we really advocate for. And listen, socialism and communism and and left mm-hmm. leftist ideals are not what Shining Path was. I mean, even even when you say like you know. 
Uh, I, th- I think uh, uh, Joe Marie uh, described the Shining Path as Maoist. But I mean, uh, Mao, we, you know, you could say he went after the landlords, but Shining Path wasn't going after the landlords only. Right. They were going after the renters as well. You know what I mean? Like, right. uh, you right. know. So right. they they were way too out there, I would say, for any – I mean, if you want to bring up, like, Maoism as probably, like, uh, extremely far left, they were more out there than uh, the most fur- far – left you can think to be quite frank from from my point of view to the point where i don't even know if you could describe them as leftists i mean <laughs> I, I i agree and i think like me growing up i i had that idea also like that to me in my head they almost seem more like right like as as i as, as i was growing up to me they seem more like fascist right wingers because of just the way like everything you saw right and everything had to be like just a certain way for them and the people that they killed i i understand now the situation better but it still doesn't make it any better right, right. like nathan, a lot of people nathan, lost their lives nathan in the chat says um shining path were so bad that other peruvian communists thought they were cia agents and many maoist <laughs> organizations today distance themselves from them even though yeah. gonzalo was the first to codify maoism and um uh, Max in the chat says, uh, Shining Path weren't even all that much of the working or peasant class. Uh, Abimal was a relatively upper middle class uh, POS uh, who saw himself as savior of the indigenous people but had no real connection. Yeah, I yeah, mean, they were also like um, American members, I believe. I think there, there were some people that uh, there was like a, a girl, I forget her name. Um, oh, right. I, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, she left prison like maybe like in 2019. Like it wasn't that long ago. I don't know what what her what what's going on with her. But yeah, there were there were some people that kind of went down there from here. I remember. Yeah, that was right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a this is a fantastic um, call. Is there anything else you wanted to to, to mention? Uh, there was one one more thing. Oh yeah. So uh, just to kind of finish the whole shining path thing, I think like yeah, like. I, I think people, groups on the left and, and other places need to think, really think and have a discussion about that because, like, a lot of the reason for why Peru hasn't, like, progressed as, as much as some other countries, uh, and I wouldn't say it's, like, a big reason because there's also, like, you know, the the classism, which is, uh, I think your guest nailed it when she said that Lima is very centrist, it's just Lima, and and that's, like, a thing that, like, I always try to, like, I was discussed with some family members. I'm like, dude, Peru is not Lima, right? Because right. there's always this mentality that, that Peru is Lima and that's it. And I'm like, no, it's not. And now there's like a, there's like a movement going on between Limeños saying like, oh, you know, Cusco, we're not going to go there. and We're going to tell our friends from other countries not to go there, you know, because they voted for Castillo and there's all this resentment. There's even, there's now there's a growing resentment towards the, 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 the smaller towns and, in the other to the other cities and it's just that's how it is but like right uh I, I, but yeah I, like per- peru is the only country outside of the u.s that i'm not a big traveler i, I haven't uh-huh. really traveled i would love to travel more but i, I just don't actually to, I, I would love to travel more but i hate traveling to make it make sense <laughs> i really hate travel yeah i like being in the different places but the whole process to get there not a fan oh, no, at I'll all you. Uh, I feel so, you. so I have an, and also money issues, but uh, I haven't right. been to many places. But Peru is the one country outside of the U.S. I've been to, and I will say, while Lima is very beautiful, obviously, you know, mm-hmm. if you go to Lima, I feel like you know you're going to a big city uh, anywhere, really. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. there are right. proving aspects to Lima, but uh, you know, you've seen uh, a big city, you've you, you know what a big city is like. I my yeah. favorite place I went to in Peru. I went to Cusco. I thought it was f- beautiful and fantastic. And obviously, you have to get uh, used to the uh, the um, the what you call altitude. it. The altitude. Altitude. Thank you, because otherwise right. you really do feel it. I've never been. I don't think I've ever been somewhere so so uh, high up like that. But uh, yeah. Re- yeah, really, really beautiful, um, and just a whole different culture. And you know, definitely if yeah. you ever go to peru definitely go to cusco i mean you have to go to cusco if you want to go to machu picchu so right uh, right right uh yeah i would i would uh, i would like to see uh some of these uh like so I, a lot of my friends like went to you know we went to a fairly decent school 
So like, I guess, you know, quote unquote decent. So like, I, I, I should have expected it, but it still shocked me to see them go like full on right wing, like post like, like all these capitalists, like memes, you know, right. like I, I was right. just kind of like, I, 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 to some of my friends here who have been complaining about their, their racist uncles and, and, you know, for the last four years, I was kind of like, oh, I understand now. <laughs> like, I just didn't, you know. You know what's really weird about this, actually? And I don't, I don't think, I don't know if the, dy- I mean, again, this could just be because I know more about Peru than other countries, mm-hmm. but um, I don't think there's any country I've seen that gets so much current day out of selling the uh, the indigenous people as yeah. tourist attraction. It is right. all you you see all the commercials. I mean, people people come to the United States. We don't like uh, we've done atrocities to the natives here, obviously, mm-hmm. and we deserve to give them so much more, obviously. But we don't really sell them as a tourist attraction. Um, you know, we I don't know any country that does it like Peru does. All their advertisements, everything yeah. is all about. The, uh, the the what the you know the tourist issue, like Machu Picchu and the areas mm-hmm. where you know the indigenous the people lines are, and all that stuff. Yes, right? it's all and in the commercials, all you see they actually like <laughs> hire them or something, I guess, to be in the commercials in the you know in the traditional. Uh, 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 I, I I don't what, what, what's how, how can you uh, indigenous garb I guess, but you know to more accurately call the specific indigenous people in Peru like you know Reina's, like with their like yeah, ponchos like the, and the, stuff like yes, that yes like, thank you like yeah. Renee want me to say it but you know indigenous people in Peru they're cholitos and cholitas I feel right. like that's much nicer to say than the one without the 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 you know the Ito there's definitely thing. I would say there's definitely like <laughs> two sides of that because like yes like there's you know like I'm 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 Asian so like people like you know call me chinito right like right. and and like there's like uh, for me, for me, it actually it actually works because I'm Chinese. But like, it's it's weird. Like, be living here in the U.S. for so long. Sometimes when that happens, I'm like, why do we do that? But you know, nobody gets mad except for like like that one incident I told you where like some people use it in like a super derogatory like manner that is just like completely hateful, you know? And like, and yeah, like that that happens, and that's right. You know, you know what's interesting? I, you just reminded me. Um... This I, I don't think this guy was from Peru, but he was mm-hmm. from South America. Do you remember the old VH1 show "I Love New York" with that? Yeah. The uh, oh yeah, when when he said when he called right. her right. Yes. And so she got so upset. it was the fir- it was the first <laughs> yeah. it was the first season of that show. People don't know "I Love New York." Right. I forget where she came from. She was a reality star from a different show. Uh, she's she uh, was from uh, she was from Flavor of Love. Thank you. Yes. So this this uh, reality show contestant if you could even I don't even know if they'll show how real real quote unquote those shows were on VH1 but Flavor <laughs> of Love was Flavor Flav's reality show where he was looking for love obviously and one of the contestants was a woman who went by a black woman who went by the name New York and she was so popular because she was so charismatic that they gave her her own spin-off show where obviously I mean obviously big spoiler alert uh, Flava of Love did not uh, connect Flava Flav and New York, and they lived happily ever after. It didn't happen. So they gave New York her own <laughs> reality show to find love. And on the first episode of the first season of that show, there were multiple seasons. Uh, there was a uh, Latino man who I think he was like Dominican or something yeah, like that. He, he goes yeah. up to her, and this is the first episode. And this is one of those right. shows where there's a bunch of men in the house, and each episode she tells someone to go home. Um, a, a Latino man goes up to her and asks if he can call her his negrita, and she fucking freaks out. She thinks she's like she she. I mean, it's like the guy called her the n word in the in, a, in right. English. You know what I mean? She completely freaked out. Sent that guy packing. He was the first guy home, and it yeah. was like. And I, I was watching this with someone who's Peruvian, my partner. And she, you know, explained to me like, damn, that's that's rough because like he was he shouldn't have done that here. But at the same time, he didn't mean anything negative by it. That's actually he actually really did mean it as a term of endearment. Right. Yeah. I I, I recently got tasked with uh, buying snacks for my office and you I bought a bunch about? of out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about those like Doña Peppa ones. Yes. The, the ones, like, those ones with the sprinkles right on top of it. Right. Right. 
and uh and I, I i i totally forgot and i was like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna set these upside down just in case because like i don't want to get you know like i just bought them out of like you know like they're good and i was like you know i i didn't really think about it but but yeah like there's there's that it, it's just it doesn't translate right so, so. I, I feel like i feel like what needs to, i feel like the easiest thing to do straight off the bat number one is the spanish word for the color black needs to change i mean <laughs> it's oh, just so yeah like that's the thing that like i remember like when i first moved to the u.s like even if i was referring to like a like a black shirt like i wear mostly black so like if i'm referring to like my clothes i had to, like i remember like i, I, I would think like oh, i gotta be kind of careful because like, I don't want this to like translate like in a horrible right. way, you know. Right, and I, so. I, I, I live I live in uh, I live in Queens in a in an area that's uh, half Chinatown, half Koreatown, and mm. in I hear this all the time, and I I know it's ca- it's probably caused problems somewhere because it's all I think about when I hear it. But what can yeah. you do? It's part of the language. There is a Korean word that sounds like the N word. Oh yeah, and yeah, it, not not only does it sound like the N word. The Korean word is like one of those like throwaway words in the English language. Like when you say to someone like "Okay, okay, okay," it's something like that. So when they <laughs> oh, say no. so, so when they say it, when they're speaking in Korean and they they say it, it's not like oh, you just hear that word that sounds like the N word in passing during like a full blown conversation. You hear them go like the word, 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 and it's like. Mm-hmm. If like you have, I, I when I first heard it, I had to look it up. I was like, I knew they weren't saying it, but I was like, I need to know what this word translates into because it's yeah. driving me wild. It's like I think there I, was like a guy, like a professor, that got fired recently. It was like a Chinese professor, and like oh, he got fired or something like that. Yes, I remember that. Yes, yeah. And it's yeah. like it's like, what do you do there? Like at the same time, yeah. like obviously these words exist in those languages where the derogatory term that it sounds like in English does not exist. So we don't want to like, mm-hmm. you know, you don't want to be like the English speaker who's like, you know, our, you know, our dictionary is, you know, our language is number one, you change it to us. And at the same time, like, listen, it is going to cause problems. I mean, what do we do about it? Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's weird. Oh, yes, Nathan, uh, Nathan, go, Nathan go, is go saying ahead. it. The word, the word is N-I space G-U-H. I, I really don't want to say it because it's. I know it's not the N word, but it's going to be. Clipped. You don't want to get clipped. Yeah, that's. But it's uh, that. That's the word too in Chinese. I don't think that's in Chinese. I think that's Korean. No, uh, it's Korean. That the one you're talking about is Korean. But there's. I think there was like a Chinese professor that got fired for saying something kind of like that too. It was like a Chinese word, I think, that was like similar to that. And and people, students complain, and it was something weird where like he got fired, but it was like. Like, dude, I mean, it's, it's like, it's, you know, it's like a weird, confusing situation. Like, what do you, I don't know. Like, oh, I just it, don't... Uh, there's a few people, few people in the chat who say it is Mandarin and it is the, equi- right. the equivalent of, uh, like, uh, and, oh, of, ah, like when you go like, uh, uh, oh, okay. that's even you okay. know, you, like, um, or which I mean, I say, um, and, ah uh, all the time. So I can only right. imagine if uh, the the word I said sounded like uh, derogatory, <laughs> and me just throwing it out there all the time. It'd be bad. It'd be bad. Uh, right, right. But yeah, uh, this was a fantastic call. I really appreciate it. I don't even think I Thank asked you, for you taking your, my call. I don't think I asked you your name. What's your name? Uh, I I just go by Noel. It's a uh, LCL Noel in the chat. Oh, okay, hey, you're you you're regularly in there. Uh, I I I. Uh, I'm, I just got on to comment on this today because I saw you in MR earlier and you mentioned that you were going to talk about this. But I've seen your, uh, uh, I, I'm subscribed. I've seen your stuff. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of your your wrestling episodes. Oh, well, thank uh, you. A, a fellow, a fellow Mark. Right. Here, yes. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got to do yeah. another one of those. Especially, I, I got to. You know what I want to try to do? I don't know if he'll go for it. Uh, I might not have to tell him. I might have to be discreet about what show it's for. But I really want to get Drake Wirtz on this show. I really want oh to try to do God, it. Oh, my God, dude. And I didn't think about it until I saw that the day after he – if people don't know uh, – I mean, if, you, if you're regular listening to the show, you should know because I've done a number of episodes with David Bixen span on him specifically. Drake Wirtz is the QAnon-believing uh, WWE referee who spread QAnon stuff, who is spreading propaganda for the Proud Boys while working for oh. WWE. He recently got fired. 
And I never, it never occurred to me to try to get him on the show until I saw that he went on a wrestling program, like a small wrestling program too, nothing too big, like literally the day after he got released. And that's a big deal because I don't know if you guys are, for non-wrestling fans, usually wrestlers don't take interviews right after they get released because WWE has a 90-day no-compete clause, which wouldn't translate to the, um, you know, the, the, the podcast and interviews, but usually they just, you know, they sit back for those 90 days and don't and, re- and relax. You know, some of them do interviews, but usually most of them stay out of the limelight until those 90 days are up. Um, I, but, I, I believe he's already taking bookings uh, I got it. from what I understand. Oh, uh, he's going to be signing, uh, doing a local signing. And I. Oh, wow. I, I, I don't know if I want to see him in person. I don't know if I want to show up to that, but I, I definitely want to get him on the show. So at least there's the. Uh, the the uh you know we keep our distance because i don't know <laughs> right you probably should yeah yeah just to kind of close i just wanted to uh the point i was trying to make earlier is that uh yeah like i think that there should definitely be a discussion about about uh, uh within the left here about those uh shining path and and that the the just going in that direction because i know that people kind of throw that like kind of just make comments and throw it away like like it's really like like it's nothing quote unquote based but but that also has like completely like you know like uh hinder like any sort of like leftist movement in Peru until like now you know it's been like decades right i mean and i, I it, listen i get the whole listen i get the yeah. whole like you know uh, ironic or or ba- you know, oh i with, understand yeah with with you know with you know i get the whole uh, you know, mao uh uh Mao's killing landlords thing like I totally mm-hmm. cuz again he's you know the 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 you're 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 looking at these people who are in power and subjugated right, poor right. people but that's not what happened with with Chinese <laughs> right no I, I mean, yeah I don't I don't want to I don't want to get like I don't I don't I, mean, I don't I, want I, to I, think I, that I'm like excusing like like you know like land, like no I completely I'm on, I'm I'm with you hundred percent. Like I, 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 again, I don't know if this is completely the right analogy, but let me use it anyway. Like you know, when we, we talk about ISIS or or groups like ISIS, mm-hmm. and you know, people right. people use them to demonize Muslim people, when in reality, um, the, the biggest victim uh, victims of ISIS are Muslim people who live in Iraq and Syria. Uh, you know, everyday mm-hmm. Muslim people. They're the ones who took the brunt of ISIS's. Terror. Right, right. Uh, it's right. the equivalent, I think, to you know, Shining Path. They were not focused on the elites and those in power. They were hurting. Right. If anything, like those around him weren't really yeah. that much affected by it. Right. Like it was, you know, like yeah. So. Right. But yeah, thank you for taking my call. This All right. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely great call. Uh, feel free to call in anytime. Seriously. Have a great night. Absolutely. You too. Bye. All right. Um. Let me uh, tell John. He's been waiting, and I think maybe John will be the last call, and then I will get to some uh, uh, clips, and then that's 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 the show. Um, I'm a little bit. My clips are not ready to go, so it will take me a second to set them up. I'm sorry if I'm a bit disjoint, dis- disorganized. Literally, right before we went live, I hear a scream from my kid's room. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. We got a. I got a call. One second. Uh, hey, you're on the air. Oh, hi, Matt. This is uh, Funky Town Tony calling from uh, North Texas. I, I I didn't expect to get on. Oh, hey, I, honestly, I was about to say, did you accidentally call? Because you sound a little bit uh, <laughs> shocked well, or out of it. Well, did I, you butt uh, dial this show? <laughs> well, I, I heard you were going to take John's call and was like, oh, and was going to not click. And then my, I, I, asked, I went ahead and clicked and you picked up. So I'm glad I got you. Um, it's good. Great, great shows today all around. MR and Doom, fantastic interview. Um, and uh, yeah, I, had, I wanted to call in and talk uh, local election stuff uh, here in North Texas. But man, there's so much interesting stuff going on. Uh, with the previous two callers, with Renee and uh, and Noel, like great stuff, you guys. Um, and uh, I want John to get his shot out because I call in pretty regularly. So thanks for taking my call, Matt and uh, John. Oh, no get problem. On, Thank you. And uh, <laughs> feel free to call in next week then and give me that update on yeah, uh, what's we'll going on in Texas. Take care. Later. All right. See you, John. One second. I'm taking it right now. 
Uh, and John, you are on the air finally. How you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I thought you had taken another call. I actually, um, I actually did, but they they heard that you were calling back in, and they were like, you know what? John waited. Let him come on. So well, here you are. Thing. I just wanted to um, say also thank you for uh, this, uh, your guest, and um, I'm I'm always been very uh, interested in uh, the Shining Path in Peru. Um, I'm I'm older than you, older probably than most of the people um, that follow you, um, and uh, you know I I uh, I remember when they used to recruit. Uh, I mean through the news in the United States when they were recruiting. Uh, child soldiers. I think the um, point that your guest was making about um, that they were Maoists isn't solely about like the land reform and the, the killing of landlords, um, but a lot of the, the re-education camps and things like that, that uh, the Shining Path seemed to embrace. Um, even, you know, like I say, I, I think I made a comment in the uh, chat that they, they were killing pa parents just to get ch child soldiers. So um, I just wanted to make a comment about that. But the main reason I called was uh, earlier today when you were on Majority Report, you were mentioning you were mentioning the uh, magnetism of the uh, the uh, uh, the anti-vaxxers. Right. Actually, up. that's one of my clips I'm going to talk about because I have a little bit more to do than we were able to do in the Majority Report. Happens all the time. I go in the Majority Report and they have something, a segment they want to do that's in my wheelhouse. But and this isn't they they because they're actually obviously do broader uh, news uh, on the majority report. But like you know, so many times I want to get like further deep into the conspiracy, and I'm like, yeah, it's probably not for this segment right now. I'll save it for my show later that night. That's what we're gonna do in a minute. But go ahead. So i um, I don't know. I just saw in a chat that someone was mentioning Virgil, Virgil Texas, and I don't know if you uh, caught Chapel Trap House talking about uh, Naomi. Uh, Wolf. Oh, right. She is. Man. Right. And uh, and actually, if you had followed some of that, if you wanted to address that, because that is just some batshit crazy stuff as well. And, uh, you know, she has a long history of this. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm kind of surprised anyone takes her seriously uh, from her from her initial books where she got uh, the the death rates of uh of uh, people with um, eating disorders incorrect uh, by a factor of like 3,000. 3, and she also um, didn't understand what death recorded me meant in her book, Outrages. Um, and she took it to mean the death penalty in Britain for uh, homosexuals, which was not what it was solely about. Um, and, you know, she's been, uh, she's been on, on board with conspiracies like... Uh, uh, chemtrails, time machines from from uh, that Apple has built apparently, um, you know, just other stuff. Um, but apparently the uh, the anti vaxxer um, the vaccine uh, shedding, you know, where you're giving apparently symptoms of people who have been vaccinated are now showing up in anti or people who have not taken vaccines. Right. So, um, you know, this was well documented by a, 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 a um, Twitter uh, handle uh, the real truther. And he has a list of all her crazy stuff. But I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Or I'm sure you are, but you follow his stuff more closely. Yeah, yes. See, I, I even think you're downplaying that. What, what happened with Naomi Wolf in her book about the, a little bit because so so basically she. Oh, what was the exact terminology? I want to make sure uh, I get this right. Um, so she had a. So she wrote an entire book, like you mentioned, on. Uh, people who were put to, to death for being uh, homosexual in the UK uh, back when they were doing that. And her claim was that that actually didn't end when the belief that it ended, uh, it's not accurate. She claimed that they were putting gay people to death long after we supposedly believe that uh, they stopped doing that. And she basically got an, the entire thing wrong, which meant, what was it? It was, where is this? Okay, so. Well, she, she, had, she had said that it was death recorded. 
in, yes, in the yes yes in in the in the uh, the justices would use that word as a way to avoid giving them the death penalty. And she, but she was claiming, well, that was uh, because they were homosexual, which may have been true in some cases. No, but she but was, was view, she was viewing it as death recorded, meaning they were recording that person's death. Right, which they, like for execution, right. and that's what it was about. It was a way for them. It was a way for the justices to avoid giving them the death penalty. Right, and listen, I totally understand if you saw a death recorded next to someone's name in a book like that. Of course, I think the first thing you'd think is that this person was put to death. It sounds sensible, but the one problem here is that Naomi Wolf was writing a an entire fucking book about this shit, well, that, which means she should have know. known. She should have looked further into it. She, the guy that interviewed her for, I think it was The Independent, um, he he took like a few seconds to go on the website of the old Bailey and find out that, you know, that's not what it was. In addition, this is a woman who has gone to Yale and then proceeded to get a doctor of philosophy at Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. You'd think you'd hope she was a little bit better in doing her due diligence. You know, she how you know people often bemoan our public education system. She went to the most elite schools and still gets all these things wrong. And not just wrong, she embraces a lot of you know batshit crazy stuff. I'm sorry, that's just how it is. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure what exactly got her banned, but the last thing that she, she was going on and on about vaccines, she totally uh, became a, 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 a nut job, and uh, she was talking about how she overheard Apple engineers a few years ago in a restaurant talk about how they invented uh, a device small enough to fit in a vaccine. That would enable time travel, <laughs> and then well, that was, no, she she had gone. Well, I, my understanding of what, what the tweets I read was she had visited Apple, and uh, she had thought they had invented time machines. Right, right, and then and then there was a a, 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 a the, the last viral tweet I saw from her, and again I don't know if this is the one that got her suspended, but she said that uh, we needed to separate. The oh yeah, the poo and the pee, yes. from vaccinated people, uh, when it goes through the uh, the water sewer system, system. The, the sewage system, excuse me, the sewage system, because we do not yet know the effects of vaccinated people feces on our drinking water. Which I got to tell you, this is wrong on multiple levels. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean. Yeah, I don't know what the hell is, uh, happened to her. I mean, she was always, in my opinion, a little bit out there, even when she was, uh, I guess, not an anti-vaxxer yeah. and talking about the Iraq war many, many decades ago. Um, the worst thing is that people uh, confuse her, it seems, uh, with Naomi Klein, who is not Naomi Wolf. Yeah. Naomi Klein no. is a extremely well-respected very, very smart, very, very intelligent. Very, like She is really good at what she does. Uh, she wrote great work on uh, climate change, specifically, that, that people cite. And it should not ever be, she should never, ever be confused oh, or mistaken dear. with Naomi Wolf. <laughs> no, I mean, I just, I'm just scary, scared, uh, excuse me, scared of where we're headed when someone this well-educated, in quotes, um, uh, Oh, well, well, doesn't I, know what the hell she's talking about. Right. And I'm sure you brought this up because you mentioned earlier the, the, the magnet vaccine clips. But the people in the clips I'm about to play for you, one of them is a nurse. A, 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 well, both of them, I think, are in healthcare. Both of them are in healthcare. One is a uh, is a do is a full blown doctor. I, I, let me get exactly because I'm familiar with her anti vaxxer work. Sherry Tenpenny is a uh, osteopathic physician. Um, legit licensed, uh, and she is one of the most prominent anti-vaxxers on the internet. Uh, I'll get more into her for the in a second because I want it to be part of that segment for when we clip it for YouTube. But um, uh, do you have anything else? Uh, or, no, no, or... no. Sorry. No, no, no. Don't. Sorry. There was a great call. Perfect to get me in the mood to get into this these clips. Uh, John, always a pleasure when you call in. Uh, hope to talk to you soon. Feel free to call in whenever. Have a great night. All right. Thank you.
All right, folks. Let's let's do this. Um, all right, and then we'll uh, we'll call this a uh, a show. Uh, we got how many clips do I got today? Let me see. Will I even have time to get to them all? <laughs> Oops. Uh, one second here. All right, we got. All right, cool, 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 cool. And give me one more second here. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't get to finish telling you my story. So right before I went live, I hear screaming coming in from the kids' room. Uh, my partner was putting the kids to sleep. And I go in there, and my daughter, the, who just turned two, was jumping on the bed. And she slipped and fell in between the bed and the wall. There's a slight opening because the heater, like the heater built into the wall like within the apartment is there. And she slipped in the small opening for the first time ever and like disappeared. And so I like ran in there. We're talking like 20 minutes before we went live. And my daughter had, uh, luckily she was fine from the fall. But when she fell, she, she had bit her lip really hard. And so there was blood and there was a pretty big, like, tooth mark on her lip. Um, and, you know, she was very scared. She's fine. She's fine. Kids do these sort of things. But, you know, when you see that amount of blood and then when kids that young and they're not used to, A, that blood and then, B, uh, a fall like that, even though she was not very hurt still, it was a, you know, scary thing for her. You know, it was all, it was all crazy. So basically... Usually right before the show, I get my clips together, order them in a way that's easily uh, available to me, and they're labeled correctly. Uh, I did not get a chance to do any of that. but So I'm just getting these clips together here right now. Um, all right, let's start with this. So earlier today, when I was on the Majority Report, uh, we played a clip from this nurse in Ohio, and... Basically, there was a home. Let, let me pull up his tweet too and reset this because um, he's been doing great work here, and I don't wanna don't wanna not um, shout him out. Um, give me one second to pull him up to see. I would have had this already, but it's all right. It's all right. You guys are very understanding. Um, you guys are very understanding. Um, so earlier today in the majority report we played a clip from a hearing in ohio uh on basically uh you know vaccines where and, and you know there's a vaccine bill that's being uh uh, voted on in Ohio, and obviously they held a hearing on it, and people from the town showed up and spread all sorts of conspiracy theories. But one of these uh, people went viral, this this nurse, for basically spreading this conspiracy theory where the COVID-19 vaccine uh, basically magnetizes you, turns you into a giant magnet, where you, know, you could take something that's magnetic and stick it to where you got the vaccine shot, and... Lo and behold, they're sticking to your arm right there. It won't come off. It's a, You're magnetized. Whoa. And what a lot of people don't know, I think, who saw this viral clip is that this is actually a conspiracy theory that's been going around for a long time. Let, let, me, let me play the clip first. Let's play this clip. Let's do this. Let's play this clip so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Here is that nurse in Ohio who is claiming at a hearing that she has become magnetized for getting the after getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Yes, vaccines do harm people. By the way, so I just found out something when I was on lunch and I wanted to show it to you. We were talking about Dr. Tenpenny's testimony about magnetic vaccine crystals. So this is what I found out. So I have a key and a bobby pin here. <laughs> Explain to me why the key sticks to me. It sticks to my neck too. Uh, 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 it won't stick to her neck though. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, get. Yeah. So if somebody can explain this, that would be great. Well, I can explain it that it's not working. You're not. Any questions? 
<laughs> so this idea that the vaccine magnetizes you is obviously bullshit. Um, you are a uh, human being, which mean your which means your skin secretes oil. Your skin also you you know, secrete sweat. Um, things stick to you. Uh, like I mentioned earlier on the majority port, you ever uh, a lot of I'm sure you have, many of you have this experience when you were at least in in school, elementary school, college, high school. You're sitting at your desk, you're sitting at the table, and you're bored maybe during a lecture or a class, and you know, you're leaning on there, maybe your pencil, you're leaning on your pencil or something, you're leaning on whatever. Long time goes by, a couple minutes go by, you lift your arm up. Lo and behold, it's stuck to you. The item you were leaning on is stuck to you. What does this mean? Did you become magnetized? No, it means you're a, like I said earlier, a sweaty little piggy. Uh, you are a gross person. I mean, literally, we're all pretty gross. You are sweaty and oily and uh, shiny and uh, you got stuff all over your skin. And I I'm pretty sweaty right now. I'm sure if I could... Um, I'm sure I could pull off. Where is my? Uh, where, I don't have a coin, do I? Womp womp. How can I prove to you that I'm magnetized? Here, let me take a. Let me take a key. Let me take a key here. Let's see how magnetized I am. Boom. Now, I'm gonna show you guys how I too, am magnetized. Here we go. You ready? Oh my God. Oh my God. Ladies and gentlemen, let me pull myself up here on the feed here. I've been magnetized. Look at that. Oh my God. Uh, oh my God. One problem. Um, this is not the arm I got the vaccine in. I wasn't vac I didn't get the, the jab in this arm. It's I got my other arm. I'm sweating like a motherfucker right now. I'm super sweaty right now in my little closet space of a studio. Uh, it is, I have the uh, AC off because uh, for sound quality purposes. And first of all, actually, we just got an AC in this new apartment. Um, it is currently in New York, uh, 65 degrees. I have two bright shining lights on me. Um, and I'm sweating. So that's why it sticks to me. Also, I don't know if you guys realize, uh, how I put it on. And you'll see this in a lot of the clips where people are claiming they're magnetized. They have their arm up like this. Anything will stay on you if you're like this. Look. Uh. Here's my phone. Oh my god, guys! I mean... Now, for people who don't know... Uh, David in the chat says, oh my God, vaccines spread to your other arm too. Right, right. Now, let me explain a little bit where this comes from. Obviously, these COVID conspiracy theories have been around uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. But obviously, now that vaccines are widespread and getting out there, a lot of these conspiracy theorists are focusing on the vaccine now. And all sorts of different conspiracy theories about the vaccine are spreading, but this one about the magnet seems to really be going viral on TikTok. Now, here's the thing about TikTok. A lot of young people use it. And on TikTok, the, uh, the dynamic of it is that all sorts of things that go viral become challenges where basically other people copy the idea behind a particularly viral popular video and they all reenact it. Some of them do it seriously. Some of them do it jokingly. A problem with TikTok is that conspiracy theories are getting sucked into that dynamic. Conspiracy theories are being used for viral content ideas. Now, obviously, there are true believers on TikTok, just like there aren't any other channels and platforms, I should say who are spreading this stuff in earnest. But there's also people who just do it for the views, for the content. No ideology behind it. 
And I have a story I'll tell you guys. It really should be its own episode, a report I put out uh, last week on Mashable. We'll get to that on a different episode. But the vac- the, the magnet vaccine challenge has become a thing on TikTok. I'm not going to play any of them for you because they. Uh, I don't want to promote any uh, conspiratorial videos that don't have that many views. Um, also, uh, I think it's easy for people to claim a, they are legit or B, they were just being ironic and joking and doing the challenge for fun, uh, based on the, <laughs> who's covering their video. So I think it's kind of pointless to play it. But what I did find are a few interesting viral TikTok videos. Well, some of them are viral, some not so much that are speaking out on this to give you guys sort of an idea of how ridiculous this is even on TikTok. Now, here's someone completely random. I came across their video on TikTok, um, and I thought it was a well-done clip. Let's play it right now. Give me one second. Sorry, vaccine nurse, uh, anti-vaxxer nurse lady. You're not up anymore. Let's go with this right here. Magnet. Okay, this is the arm I got vaccinated on. And I've been trying this for a minute. Maybe they only microchip the white people because it's not working. <laughs> well done, Lauren Andres 6. Another great one I saw debunking this is from this user here. The only side effects I felt was that my arm was very, very sore, extremely sore. And I was really tired, but other than that, today I'm feeling like 100% myself. Nothing feels wrong. I feel great. Um, to my understanding, I don't think any magnets will. <laughs> will... The 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 uh, text on her Insta her uh, TikTok video says this dumb trend is going viral on TikTok right now. Right. Uh, stick to me. Let's see. Oh, she's gonna put <laughs> the magnet on her arm. Oh my God, it's sticking to her arm. Her mouth is wide open. She can't believe she's become magnetized. Wait for it. Just fucking with you. I literally put tape on the back of this shit. <laughs> well done, uh, Ali Car- Car- Cardis, it looks like. I'm sorry if I messed up your name, Ali, but well done. She put magnet. She put tape on the back of her magnet to fuck with people. Uh, well done. And another person I saw calling this shit out, uh, is this dad on TikTok? Pennies are made out of copper. Copper is not magnetic. The title of this video, by the way, with the text on it is My Dad Debunking the COVID Vaccine and Magnet Lie. And here he is testing out all these different coins to see if they're magnetic. Nickels not are made out of a metal called nickel. And the metal nickel is not magnetic. Dimes before 1964 were made out of silver, and six di- since 1964 are made out of an alloy of silver and other metals, which is not magnetic. Quarters, just like dimes before 1964 were made out of silver, which is not magnetic, and since 1964, quarters have been made out of a combination of silver and other metals, which are not Now, this piece of metal is a lot heavier than any of these coins. So you might be thinking, this is not a real magnet. It's a real magnet. Well done, uh, Teus Lively's dad. Very good. I enjoyed those videos. Listen, TikTok's good sometimes. I uh, got some good stuff up there like that. People, that's become a thing too. People, we could talk about uh, using conspiracy theories for content in a negative way, but there's also people who are doing a good job on there uh, using conspiracy theories for content, but in a positive manner, which is debunking the stupid viral shit going on there. Um, well done, you guys. That was that was good stuff. And to give you a little bit of a background on that, uh, anti more about that anti-vaxxer nurse in Ohio, from uh, these are clips, by the way, from Tyler Buchanan, uh, who took these clips. Thank you, Tyler. Great stuff. Um, the nurse was basically defending uh, Sherry Tenpenny, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, who is, as I was talking to a caller earlier, uh, is a legit osteopathic physician. 
Um, so here you have a nurse, a legit nurse, and a legit osteopathic uh, physician spreading these conspiracy theories, which should show you that it really doesn't matter how what anyone's title is and their education level is. I mean, this shit is everywhere and and and, and fucks with everyone. But Dr. Sherry Tenpenny is actually not just your run-of-the-mill conspiracy theorist or anti-vaxxer. She is an anti-vaxxer influencer. In fact, she's one of the biggest anti-vaxxer influencers on the entire internet. Now, you guys might remember when I had a guest uh, from the Center for Countering Digital Hate on this show after they put out a fantastic report that was labeled The Disinformation Dozen. And basically, this report found that 12 individuals were responsible for something like 68% or something like that, some ridiculously high percentage of all the anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory content on all of the major platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, etc. 12 people are basically responsible for your family, your friends, your relatives, your loved ones, your coworkers, your acquaintances. 12 people are responsible for those people in your life believing in this crazy anti-vaccine bullshit. And Dr. Sherry Tenpenny is one of those 12. Let's play a clip from her from this Ohio um, hearing. Let me pull it up right here. Give me one second. Do, 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 do. Here is Sherry Tenpenny. And some of the information that I think had been discussed on your podcast related to EMF frequencies. That was a thought. And, and it was you, because now, because right now that? we're all kind of um, hypothesizing. I mean, what is it that's actually being transmitted that's causing all of these things? Is it a combination of the protein, which now we're finding has a metal attached to it? I'm sure you've seen the pictures all over the internet of people who've had these shots and now they're magnetized. They can put a key on their forehead, it sticks. They can put spoons and forks all over them and they can stick. Because now we think that there's a metal piece to that. There's been people who've long suspected that there was some sort of an interface, yet to be defined, an interface between what's being injected in these shots and all of the 5G towers. <laughs> Not proven yet, but we're trying to figure out what is it that's being transmitted to these unvaccinated people. Right, uh, right. Nothing is being transmitted to these, an these vaccinated people except for the mRNA that is in their bloodstream that fights the COVID-19 protein that sticks to people's body when they get it and causes the most damage, which obviously the vaccine will fight against. I mean, she really threw everything out in there. The, uh, the magnetism thing that I just debunked, we got a little bit of the 5G. Oh, man, there was another one she mentioned that I'm having a mental block of right now. Right at the beginning, she mentioned one of them. Oh, uh, uh, I can't remember. But just, just this is the bullshit that's coming from these well-educated people. I mean, this is what I talk about when I say that, you know, we these conspiracy theories are really big among a certain subsection of the health and wellness world. Uh, especially those who are into alternative medic medicines. Um, this is bad. Like, this is, these are like, like, look at that lady. If she was talking to someone who wasn't very political, like, for example, your mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, cousins, you know, someone who, anyone who's not in this wheelhouse here, who doesn't know what's going on, she seems just by her looks like she'd be a completely normal lady. Throw the, Throw the doctor in front of her name, and you got some sort of uh, respect for her, her, you know, her vocation. I mean, we gotta debunk these people. Got to. Even if all the current conspiracy theorists, even if all the anti-vaxxers don't care about your debunk, it's important to stop people from listening to individuals like Sherry Tenpenny. It's it's ridiculous. Come on.
5G and magnetism. I mean, give me a break, Sherry. Give me a break. Folks, <laughs> I'm I'm sweating. That's why I before I before I actually um tested out doing this earlier. Um not because I wanted to see if I was magnetic, but to see if the uh for my visual uh accompaniment to this segment of doing it as a joke would work and I wasn't sweaty yet because I was in the other room because I wasn't in the heat of the lights and the AC was still on and it didn't stick to me. Like it wouldn't even, even when I was going like this, it would slide off. Um, but because I'm now also a sweaty little pig, um, it's sticking. Uh, am I going to do anything else? Let's see. Uh, do I want to do, how long are we going here? Three hours almost, Christ. Um, let me do, eh, let's, let, that, that's the show, I think. I think that's the show. The, these other two I wanted to talk about, uh, I feel like I can't do them justice right now. I'll save them for next week, or I'll do them and I'll do them another day, I promise. Uh, I just feel like uh, if it was another topic I could do, basically I have these two videos from Fox News about two people complaining about cl critical race theory. Uh, I, I want to get a little bit into those. They're pretty ridiculous. But um, I feel like I can't do them justice after well, 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 almost three hours in right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on that. Um, folks, that is the show. Oh, wait, let me read the Super Chats and then that's the show. Uh, where are all the super chats? They're not showing up in my. Uh... All right, here we go. Renee with a super chat. Uh, ask about Vargas Losa as a pathway to Fujimori. Ask about Montesinos. I'm sorry, Renee. These were all during the interview. Um, Renee also said uh, theo theology of liberation. And Cholo is the Peruvian N-word. You have my permission to punch anyone that uses that word. <laughs> uh, and Samantha with a super chat. Samantha Sider with a super chat. All Fujimoris are star, 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 star. Uh, Paul leaders in Peru. Political leaders in Peru. Oh. <laughs> All right, folks. That is the show for today. I don't, I'm really thinking about doing these two videos. I don't know what's up with me. I think maybe I should hold off. I should hold off on these specific videos. Yeah, let's, 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 yeah. Like Zoe says, this happens every week. Yeah, I could save it. I'll save these two. There'll probably be one more, actually, next week, and I could bring it into this segment, which would actually help. Three is a trend, right? So I'll save it for the third, the third one that sh pops up. All right, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. You know how to support this show. If you're not already a patron, most of you are who made it this far, but if you're watching live right now, patreon.com slash mapbinder to support this show. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're not already. <sighs> oh, boy. Good thing I'm ending it now because I just, I think that's it for me. Uh, what is it? I did how many hours today? Three hours here almost and then an hour and a half. Is it an hour and a half? An hour and a half on Majority Report earlier and then also I worked today. Um, but anyway, see you guys all next time on Doomed. Have a great night, everybody.